deep tones. I can turn that up on this. We're live. Oh, sweet. Hey, guys. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Happy Whiskey Wednesday. We didn't see you there. We have a great episode oh, okay. coming to you right now, and we're going to um, share all of this for ourselves. And we advise you and we appreciate if you liked and shared it as always for our. Um, returning listeners and for everyone that's new and tuning in for the first time please share it and like it and please leave a comment of what you're smoking and what you're drinking tonight if you are and don't be afraid to join in on the conversation tonight we're going to be talking about brand image and it's probably a great well it is a great thing that we have Kirk Cottle with us tonight and I know Kirk from my uh, videographer you know days and stuff like that and I admired a lot of his talent and his content that he created and his skills along with editing and videography and photography and all that stuff he's actually created a company it's called Makery Company that's awesome so we're gonna dive into that more um, as you know we always do a whiskey a cigar and we talk about our topic tonight is a special night because it is repeal day December 5th to uh, celebrate repeal for prohibition so it's kind of awesome so um, we got the repeal batch uh, limited edition from Jim Beam distillery um, we've actually started drinking we'll get into the notes and the tasting notes and what we think of it um, and I think it's a pretty I'll just say I think it's a pretty good bang for your buck right off the rip um, we're gonna be smoking the Camacho Ecuador we might have had that on one of our earlier episodes um, I don't think so but it's a great cigar yeah. And then we're also going to have the Romeo, I always forget this one. Romeo. It's just a Romeo? Yeah, Romeo by Romeo. Okay. Romeo, cla- I, is it classic? <laughs> they, nope. It's just Romeo by Romeo. Just stop that thing, man. All right. Quit churching it up. All right. Well, we'll uh, Steve's getting his one more. stuff shared. Tinderbox at Easton. Our stuff shared. Thank you. I just do that. Do what? <laughs> just... Just mine. I'm sure it's a group. I don't have man. any bourbon groups anymore. I do cigar groups. I do cigar groups, man. It will be interesting tonight because Kirk doesn't really drink or smoke a lot. So even at the, you know, just a little bit ago, we were, you know, talking about how to light a cigar and stuff like that. We'll probably get into that even more, you know, throughout the evening. You know, we have to relight that thing. Exactly. So. Yeah. Maybe. It'll definitely happen. It'll be a learning night. I like it. Yeah. Oh, and for live listeners, don't, or I'm sorry, but we will do the um, the calling for our winner tomorrow night, or the giveaway. Okay. And then, uh, so everyone... Center Jake on that. So everyone that has entered in already, we thank you. And if you haven't entered in, please go to our post on Instagram and Facebook, and the instructions are, you have to like and share the actual video and leave a comment and tag three friends and then that gets you entered in to win a really, really good sample box from Crown Heads. So they have until tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. I'll give them until tomorrow. All right. All right. You want to do it? Yeah, we're good. What's up, Jake, Dustin, two other people watching, Dylan, Ryan, Nate, all you guys. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to get started here. Oh, before we start, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that intro like the not the <laughs> not the way I've been doing it like the way I should have been doing it so this is completely new but you no it's not you new it's, it, it's, it's you don't have to say it. it you don't have to say anything oh perfect that's typical <laughs> it's not typical what I forgot what we were doing right you ready to go yeah are you ready for this big intro are you guys watching ready for this big intro I didn't hear anyone say yes well, they're on there. Oh, cool. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and happy Whiskey Wednesday. I'm Jake Sanders, along with Steve Crane, and we make up the Bourbon and BS Podcast, episode 44. We have a lot to talk to you about tonight. We have our special guest, Kirk Caudell, on tonight. Caudill, sorry. Uh, uh, like I said, we talked about this. <laughs> it's like a five-minute conversation know about how to say his last name, and you... Yep. You went, yeah. I did. You zigged. That's okay. So is that. How's it going? It's good, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have you on tonight, and I hope Steve will understand once we get started just because of how I know you doing the Makery Company and how you started that, along with 
you know, countless other things with doing, you know, teaching yourself how to create brands and the videography and the photography and the editing and stuff like that. And the reason why I'm talking about that is because our topic of this evening is going to be brand image. So I thought that was perfect for you. We thought that was perfect for you to talk about. And I think it will make some, for some really, really good discussion tonight. If, you're the fir if this is the first time you ever listen to the Bourbon MBS podcast, we do a whiskey, we sample a cigar, we talk about the pairing and what we like and what we don't, don't like about it, and then we go off on our own agendas with our topic. So it can right. get pretty interesting with our uh, topics of the evening, but it's... We hope it's interesting. It's always good. It's always good. Yeah. And last night, was, or last time, last week was really, really good um, with... Uh, Miguel. Miguel from Crown Heads. And we just said it on live, but, well, I can't tell the audio because it'll be Friday and they can't. They wouldn't. Before we... No, I get it. No, I know how. Yeah. That days work, yeah. Yeah. The elders. Before we release the, the winner... Difficult. Before we release the winner, they won't be able to... So by the time it. they hear this, right now that you're talking yeah. on their yeah, the audio... audio. <laughs> They'll miss it. They'll so miss what it. happened, like, is, is it now now? Or is this... What day is this? It's Wednesday. But for them, it's Friday. Right. Or m Monday or another or Friday. Day. Yeah. Whenever this group is. Yeah, but it comes out on Friday. That's, so that's the need. earliest that they can listen to it. Yep. <laughs> What's cool about tonight is that we got the Jim Beam limited edition repeal batch. And the reason why that's so special is because it's December 5th repeal day. So it's to celebrate you know, the repeal of Prohibition. And uh, I think it was the uh, 18th Amendment, so I, I believe. Um, but, I feel like you just say this yeah. on the bottom. So, <laughs> if it wasn't for that... We were just talking about branding, guys. I know, <laughs> I know. Come on, Jim Beam. Like, <laughs> get it together or you're going to fail. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be able to sample this great juice that we love. And I'm, I'm thankful for it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this is a good time to uh, say... At this point, the best way to support this, if you guys are enjoying it, share uh, the video that you listen to right now on Facebook Live. I saw a couple of people say that they were already sharing it. And then also, if you're listening to the audio on YouTube, share the YouTube channel. Share any way that you're actually listening to it. Or if you're telling a friend about it, then that, that's the point where you can say, well, what do you guys listen to podcasts on? Or what do you, uh, are you at your desktop computer? Do you have YouTube in the background? You know, Kirk was saying that he does that a lot of times. And then there's other people that listen to iTunes, Spotify, Overcast. Any of these things, um, you can even listen to it. A lot of people even go back and listen to Facebook video yeah. in their car and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different options there. So please share it, like it, follow, all that good stuff. Uh, and then also thank you to our sponsors, which you have Altus USA, mm -hmm. which is going to be our second one. <laughs> Here's our first one. Well, no, not second sponsor, <laughs> our second cigar. So okay. Altus USA is a big supporter of ours. You can see it in the, the background on the flag if you're watching in the video. And then also Tinderbox of Easton, who supplied the uh, Camacho Ecuadors tonight. Yes. And the SCR company, which I was smoking before yeah. the podcast, and we'll probably There's finish always, that smoke. Yeah, it's normally the third cigar of the evening. There's always some floating around. Which we talk about brand there, too, brand image there. Yeah, we've talked a lot about branding, the branding right. and how, like, the BS. We won't talk about it, that's good. No, it's, no, it's great. Probably, no, it's not relevant tonight, so. <laughs> I don't know if you're sarcastic or, I don't know, I don't know where you're going with this. Me neither. Well, <laughs> I mean, you want to dive into the whiskey? Yeah. Or do you think we should introduce Kurt? You really did. I think you should tell me about the whiskey because, like I said, I'm not a huge drinker. I'm not a big smoker. Well, I drink, like I was telling them before the podcast, I got it. My wife got me into wine. I kind of started, you know, trying a lot of different things. I'd like to come home with trying something different every single time as opposed to, you know, some people like to find the one thing that they love and that's all they ever do. Yeah. But not I, you. Not me. Yeah. I, so when, you know, Jake messaged me and was like, hey, would you like to be on? I'm like, dude, I'm not like a big bourbon or cigar guy, but like, I'd like to be. Like, that sounds yeah. like cool. I like good taste. I would like to think that I'm I have I'm always taste, like, honestly, know. I'm always nervous when I ask people that. Because, you know, yeah. like. Ask them what? Ask, you want to be on? No, I, I'm always nervous, like, about, like, people, like, about, like, the drinking and the smoking. Because it's like, some people take it yeah. wrong. And it like my grandma would totally take it wrong. Yeah, so she won't she be would, on. She would not like me being on this. Would she be on? She would question. probably not. <laughs> is she local? She's not local. Well, that's probably the biggest. Reason. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's just inconvenient for anyone to you know. I mean, 
Anyways. Well, yeah. She seems like a nice lady. No, she totally is. Oh, she just has great pots. Great pots. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so, Kurt, <laughs> tell us what what was like the first whiskey you ever tried. Do you remember? Oh, first whiskey was definitely Jack Daniels. Yeah, that was uh, that was a bad experience. It was really bad. It was was fir- it too much? It was, was, uh, it, excessive. It, was a lot. it It wasn't like yeah, sit that down. Was it. That was it. It was never <laughs> drinking for pleasure. It was yeah. more for volume because... <laughs> A rough year in middle school. Alcohol right? for yeah. middle. Believe it or not, <laughs> eighth grade was tough. You guys will probably get a kick out of this. Um, I never, <laughs> I never really dated anybody else except for my wife. Wow. I've been with my wife for like it's like I don't know, eleven years now. Congratulations! And, yeah, you sound really excited about it. No, it's great. It really is. It's so weird. We're just yeah. recently married, though, right? We've been actually married for five years. Okay, well, it's so right? <laughs> six years of dating, though, based on that man. Basically, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it was kind of crazy. So that being said. I, I did the typical, well, what I found out later is the not typical. I had my bachelor party the night before my wedding. That, I mean, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, woke up and had the wedding. But that being said, the first time I ever had whiskey was on my bachelor's party. And Smart. That was, no. <laughs> How'd you feel the next day? Oh, not great. Yeah. Not great. It was, I got woken up and he's like, Kirk, you got to, you know. Finish. I wasn't writing my vows, but I was writing a letter to her that she was supposed to read. You know, it's a whole like ceremony. Are you typically thing. a procrastinator? Yes, I am. There it is. I am. So, right but, on. Right know, on. I think that's the best creativity, though. Is like yes. I'm the kind of Thank guy you. under pressure, but I have to force it. Yeah. With and my own deadlines. Now that I run a business, and you know, you have to be like professional. I was gonna say, watch what you're saying. Exactly. Somebody is looking at it's at all right. I I, I want to say that's probably my strongest reason to probably hire me is like the follow through being on time and being like, hung over during the yeah, crunch time absolutely not yeah. absolutely <laughs> not. absolutely <laughs> never I saw you slip that in there <laughs> no I mean you're right that it's not typically the bachelor party is, is not the night before yeah but that's I mean, I, for me that was all the fun that's that was a high happens. stakes game like it was you know you gotta get there so when I was, I was married before and, and we had the bachelor party but then it was like you know my ex and, and, and all her girls were at our house so I was at my buddy Mitch's house and it was kind of like a similar thing where yeah. it's like not really the bachelor party where everyone's together and it's like alright let's just drink a shit ton and yeah. let's get hammered and it's like you know Brandon who's been on the show before him and my good friend friend Craig were this was the night before the wedding or night before the wedding at Mitch's house yeah, <clears throat> yeah um, great idea to sit through a wedding and like, well, <laughs> no, the worst part was is that I gave Craig on accident sleeping pills in the morning. Did I ever tell you that story? Oh ah. my goodness. <laughs> Anyways, that's a story for another time. And he was the groom? No. Oh, no, that, that would have made for I was oh, that would have made for a funnier story. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the wedding, he was up at the altar. He was one of my uh, my groomsmen. <laughs> but him and Brandon were basically having a conversation on the side of the, the house, kind of similar, you know, just absolutely annihilated. And I remember this. I went out to check on them, and they were literally like having a conversation. And one of them would puke. It wasn't ever that bad. And then basically they would move down a little bit and keep talking. And the other one, like it was, it was banana boat. It was bad, yeah. yeah banana boat. No, Craig, I thought had a headache, and so I asked Mitch if he had Advil. This is a short story, um, but yeah, he uh, he said, yeah, I got some Advils on my desk, and it was still early in the morning. So I was trying to look out for my good friend. I can see our viewership dropping. He's out. gonna be hammered. <laughs> he's go- he's gonna be uh, absolutely like you know just hurting. So I'm like, all right, you know. So I grabbed this bottle of pills on his desk in his bedroom, which I didn't know my way around. So I grab a bottle of pills and I, I I pop out three of them. And I'm like, here, Craig, take these. Do they look like Advil? Yeah, they look like pills, man. It's dark. <laughs> I mean, Advil's all different colors, I feel like, at this point. It's, just, yeah, it's, like, it's color, green right? and like a weird brown. So anyways, I, 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 wake, I wake Craig up, and I'm like, hey man, just try to take these. You're going to feel better later. You know, you're, you're going to be hungover. This will help. And so he takes them, goes back to sleep, and then someone else asks for some Advil. I'm like, yeah, no problem. By this point, it got a little lighter uh, outside. Good. And so I go and got the same bottle, and sure enough, they were sleeping pills. And recommended dosage is one per night. And so we tried to get him to puke it up, and that didn't happen. But he made it through. He was a trooper. I mean, we were sitting there before the wedding, and sure enough, we felt so bad. We kept checking on him. And like, what a we, were, guy. we were sitting there, like, kind of like we are here at the table, right? And everyone's like eating like sandwiches before your wedding, and kind of like, you know, snacking yeah. or whatever in the church. And, and all of a sudden, you just hear, and it's Craig, I'm not making this up. It's not a movie. Like, his head would be on the ground, like on the table, just being <laughs> boom. And he'd just be like, Craig, Craig, wait. 
Wake up, wake up. <laughs> yeah, and the two guys on the other side of him were like kind of squeezed in just to make sure he didn't just go down. Oh my nice. goodness. This has to be our most interesting intro. <laughs> to date. <laughs> Easily. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, after talking about sleeping pills, you want to get into the whiskey? I'm All right. <laughs> So, and if anyone has a headache, I'll grab you some Advil. <laughs> no, I think you're off that dude. <laughs> Anyways, so, yeah. Again, tonight we're going to be t- t- sipping on the Jim Beam Limited Edition Repeal Batch. Again, the reason why we're doing that is because it's Repeal Day. Prohibition lasted from 1920 to 1933. So about 13 years up until they finally deemed it completely idiotic to ban alcohol. Surprisingly, the Great Depression was in that, that era. Yeah, exactly. Huh. So what does that tell you about history? <laughs> don't ban alcohol. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sure, let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> that, that seems like that's accurate. Yeah, I'll just keep it that way. Sure. Anyways, so tonight we're going to be talking about branding. And that's why we picked this bottle too. So it's kind of all-encompassing in what we're you know talking about tonight. Because it kind of has, if you look at the bottle, it's got an old old kind of English writing. I would say, not English, but almost the same font that we used on, you know, our logo. Yeah. An older style, what would you say? Like, just like Times New Roman, kind of weird? It's not Times New Roman, I don't know. I mean, it's just, a, it's an older style font. Yeah. With a little more like bubbles on it, you know what I mean? What, like I, like a, flare. what I like about like the side, um, you know, white lettering on the, the label is the fact that it kind of looks like, a, it almost reads like an old newspaper. Yeah, absolutely. And then obviously- the It's way, got that petite, like whatever, you know, like the, the vintage look to it too. Yeah, that brown almost, what would you say? I, like, like it's been in a cigar shop for a while. Yeah, that too. That's what it looks like. But yeah, so it's 43%, so 86 proof. It is a four plus year old bourbon whiskey, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. It is non-chill filtered, and it also has a mash bill of 77% corn, 13% rye and 10% malted barley. So it's the exact same stuff that comes into the regular, like Jim Beam white label that you really? see everywhere and it's all around the world. But it is 3% higher because the white label is 80 proof. Okay. And this is 86 proof. Right. And then this is also non chill filtered. So we've kind of talked about that and, mm-hmm. and alluded to that on some things that we've tried on the podcast before. But. So what that means is just a different styling method, and it's just not, they, they don't chill it like through the filter, and there, there's a lot of people that think it changes the whiskey. I'm one of those people. I think it messes with it. I, it just tastes, maybe not messes with it, because that's like a, a negative point, but it just changes it. Well, it messes with it for your style and your taste. Yeah, I mean. Does it change the taste? I mean, it, it, I would think it. I mean, otherwise, they, this the reason it says on here because it is not chill filtered. It may appear cloudy or contain sediment at the bottom, just like it did back in the thirties. So I mean, is that why you do the non chill filter? Is that just removing some of the, the sediment and the the cloudiness to it? I mean, is that the, the whole point? It doesn't. I don't really, think so. I mean, you're I not see. like distilling it again. You know what I mean? You're just yeah, running okay. through a filter to get that shit out of there. To be honest, I don't think that makes sense. Which, but I think that's why they started doing that in the first place. But nowadays, like we have so much better technology than they did back then. Yeah. When they did do everything non-chill filtered, that I don't think you have to worry about it nowadays. Like having like little pieces of char, you know, at the bottom. However, I have seen bottles, that, and I honestly, I'm one of those guys that think it's cool. I would there's think a little cool. piece. There's like a little piece of barrel that's like in there. Okay, still. so that's what would be in there. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so Kurt, so let, listen. I'm I'm new to this. It makes sense. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll go yeah. with it. So you know, so I'll I'll tell you. Kurt. So barrels are charred on the inside. So what happens when you filter it out is some of that char. You know, they call it alligator skin. Mm-hmm. So it almost flakes off, and that's what's you know gonna. If you see a filter, if you're good at a distillery, and you see them empty a barrel, you're gonna see all this char that kind of floats out, and they filter it out. That's it. Interesting. So, yeah. yeah. But some of that residue in some bottles stay in. Dustin says that uh, chilling the whiskey allows the fatty acids within it to be slightly filtered out more. Whiskeys that are not chill filtered are the straight up more natural versions of whiskey. Thank you, Dustin. I mean, it would make sense. <laughs> Don't we like fatty acids? I mean, uh, I mean, I just took omega 3. Yeah, some, well, there's different types of fatty acids. So, that's a whole other thing. I that's think, like what I my wife wants to do. It's all I think nutrition. We want those. It's all nutrition. I think we want those fatty acids. What I like about this is the fact that 
they kind of brought back like an old style of doing things. And, you know, branding wise, it's just like another thing on Jim Beam's list. Yeah. You know, I mean, they have, I mean, besides, I mean, them and Wild Turkey and Buffalo Trace, I mean, are the, the big dogs, I think, that are coming out. They have a bunch of different names and different types of whiskeys that they produce. You know, like Jim Beam has like Booker's, all of the Booker's line, all the Knob Creek line, all the, you know, you have Jim Beam Black, Jim Beam White Label, Jim Beam Rye, there's a, there's a double oak, there's a distiller's cut, I mean. Is there any like bourbon or whiskey that has never changed? Like it, they just offer just the one. Maker's Mark was the long one for a while. Yeah. And Woodford, and Jack Daniels. I would think they've changed, I mean, <clears throat> maybe the recipe hasn't changed, but I mean, you, you, you'd have to think with the, the, the vast just change of, of volume. Well, I just mean like the, what everything that they offer, like, you know, if Jim Beam came to the market with that one bottle, it was always one bottle. And they haven't added any Haven't side added bars. anything, hasn't expanded the line. This is just exactly what think, we initially started with. And this I think is that was Maker's Mark for the longest time. But, yeah. he's, but they added other things now, like Maker's 46. Is that what you're saying? They've added more Yeah, products, exactly. Like yeah. I'm saying they're probably like the, the last the few. last to make the expansion. Yeah, and the they products. had to. Yeah. I, I think they had to to make a awake in the industry. That's why everybody came out with single barrels and stuff back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Because they were trying to rebuild the bourbon industry and that's how they could do it by making it seem to be a premium mm -hmm. spirit. You know, so. Well, other than that, like, what do you guys think of it? Actually, the taste of it, what do you, we've been drinking it and so I'd like to hear what you guys think of it because. No, I no, that's not how it's No, good. yeah, let's well, see, we've decided that 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 doesn't work because once I start rattling shit off, you're just like, yeah, yeah. To me, it tastes like um, the first thing that pops in my head is like red hot chew, like gum. Like I feel so like, red hot. Yeah. So you get a little heat. A little bit, but like but I said, I'm big... cinnamon. Yeah. Really? Okay. Like it's it's a little sweet to me. Yeah. It's, it's very sweet. It should be sweet. Seventy seven. Well, so I drink a lot of dry wine, so this is probably oh, why yeah. it like yeah. tastes sweet to me, but. Out of all the ones that I've had, it's definitely the better one. <laughs> That's good. I can, I can pick up that little cinnamon note back there. I think it's got, I mean, obviously, you guys listen to me talk a lot about, you know, how, like, corn brings out those sweetness notes. Dude, it's got corn in it. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it, it just, you can, yeah. it, it tastes like corn. All right, tell me this. Right here, after, like, the, the aftertaste, you just ate. Where, like, right in the back like of the Right throat. here, and right now, you guys all took a sip recently. Do you, do you taste like does it does it taste like you just had like a handful of Fritos? <laughs> Fritos, I love corn chips. Right I, like, I like that. I can't say I've had a lot of them, so Fritos. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm missing out. I mean, I had some tribal tacos in the day, so like yeah, 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 a yeah. few of those, but not just those. Without the Fritos, you never just yeah. had Fritos. No, man. I listen. I grew up in a very strict household. That's why you're like, so lean and yeah. Well, yeah. listen, my mom would hide stuff from me and my dad. Like if she bought <laughs> hohos. She would hide them. Why is she buying? Because she wanted them. Oh, that's... And we could, she was okay with us having them <laughs> in sparse amounts. But then it became like a game. Like, like we were all, like, all over the house. Like it was like in the garage. Let's the put it this way. Uh, once houses. they were in, like, you know how you guys have like the old kitchen lights that were like, it was like bold? Yeah. And she like threw them in. I feel like it was a fire hazard. It, it probably was. Did they melt? Like... No, they didn't melt or anything. But I like, one day I like looked up and there happened to be like, a different shadow cast on the ground of like, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's I'm great. The, what? Yep. I love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't, so, I didn't have any So he doesn't get that notion. Jake and Dustin are in the garage. I mean, like, uh, Fritos? Anyone? Corn chips? No. Yeah, well, because the corn, yeah. I mean, I, but that's what it's like actually the, the. That's the aftertaste yeah. you get from it? Yeah. See, when you said that I get it off the nose, like I just taste like Tostitos. I definitely like the smell. I the taste, smell is very... It's Fritos, man. Or I Tostitos. smell like yeah. Tostitos, just restaurant man, style. Man, you're all about that corn. Yeah. There's a lot to it. Corn chips, to be precise. Yeah, exactly. Like Frito-Lay. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely do get that hint, that little hint of cinnamon back there. I think with that non-chill filtering, though, it adds like that little bit of that... There, there's, a, there's a tannic note back in the very very back okay. um, and you can kind of get that it's almost because it's not charcoal filter but it's all it, 
I'm getting like a charcoal-y thing in the back, maybe. I don't know. Not but getting that. Listen, you guys have way more experience. So, like, I, I'm sure everybody here has at least at one point heard about Gary Vee. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, right? Sure. And he started out his, and he's just like, you know, all these people would say all these things, and, like, nobody never tasted it. I didn't believe anybody had tasted a dirty sock before. Right. Like I'd sit down there in the basement, wine library, wine library and yeah. I tasted a dirty sock, and I'll tell you exactly what it tastes like, and it did not taste like a dirty sock. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, so, like, really expanding your palate to the point of, like, what, you know, what is what? Like, well, yeah, and that's what, you know, like, we make fun of it a lot about how if you read these bottles, some of them, especially, like, the Midwinter Night's Dram that we've had yeah. on by High West, they go into this elaborate, you know, story on, like, what you should pick out of it and what you get out of it and like you get that like barnyard and like leather and earthy and all the things that make me feel manly yeah <laughs> barnyard yeah barnyard well but not necessarily the yard but like a barn leather sure. Sure. charcoal like just like yeah, yeah. Things. brimstone yeah. cigarettes I mean all the reason why I kind of want to get into like cigars yeah. and bourbon I'm like no and like they all use that for like cigars whiskey like colognes a lot of times you'll get that too you know like musty yeah like, oh that's exactly what I'm smelling in the morning yeah. Must. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, I really want to turn on the girl at work. Yeah. You know what I mean, I try to like. By smelling the story, like the shirt like, that you left in your yeah. closet for four yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. No, I swear it's a clean shirt. It's my cologne. <laughs> but I think it's an agreed upon thing. That's the, like that's where like that's where I come out with the, we talk about food flavors a lot. It's yeah. not just you know the barnyard and everything. I mean, I think those are agreed upon. To your point, like the dirty sock example. But that's what you've experienced. But I don't think yeah. you're gonna elaborate on like. When, when you taste whiskey, you're not, it's not going to like bring you back to like a time in your life like a song would and say, oh, this is... Fritos, man. <laughs> I haven't had Fritos in a time. Okay, well, I guess <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it brings back for Steve. So, I might get back Jim to the Bean food, repeal batch is Fritos. Uh, when when Fritos, can we get a fact check when Fritos came out? Uh, Frito <laughs> Lay? Just, I mean, I'm curious. It's just a if it comes out Jim during Bean. this era, I guarantee there's Fritos in I do think that this is a see here's where I get kind of nerdy like I think it's a little shiny and the reason why I say that shiny like moon yeah. shiny no just like glittery not uh, glittery it, it, it's it, I think you guys are now describing intangible things that I haven't I think, tasted I think, you haven't tasted shiny no, no, see that's have you was, tasted colors that's what I was trying to get to is because I tasted skittles oh, there you go but that's what I'm saying is like I'm sure you've listened yeah, to Gary yeah. V and like he's not when he was doing the wine library and stuff like that. He it brings out experiences. No, that, it totally does. That's what it. That's what people say it tastes like. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because that's one of those things. I think it's more of a brand branding. Well, thing. hey, yeah, it's 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 your it's like what how you interpret it, and that's a lot of the things that like we're talking about branding tonight is. That. We had a fact. What so fact when was the repeal? What year? It was uh, the repeal, nineteen thirty three. And what year did Frito Lay Fritos come out? Frito corn chips were created in 1932. Oh, Boom. wow. Get the fuck out wow. of here. Wow. Really? You just That's rewrote history. <laughs> I'm just saying. You just rewrote history. You want to talk about, you know, bringing it back to the, you know, history. So, Beam yeah. Centauri, please send us a sponsorship because. And Nate Hale just chimed in right after you said that one year before <laughs> Prohibition ended. Steve it may or may not be related. Out. I'm just saying that is amazing. That is amazing. amazing. Good job. Fucking zeroing in on shit today. <laughs> this is gonna be a good discussion. I, his palate must just be. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go to the. Smart Everybody place. else is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, tell me this. You guys were talking about before. You kind of said that, like this is like a good bang for your buck as far as you yeah. Know, what is that? What it? What is a good bang for your buck? Is there this a price? Was, uh, is there like seventeen ninety nine? So out the door, it's like 19 and some change with with Ohio State tax. I think anything under $30 and you find amazing and that you can drink every day that you would like to have, you know, a pour of Mm -hmm. is is something special. And I think that's a bang for your buck. But at $17.99, you said? $17.99. I think at that price, I mean, that's just, you, you don't hear that anymore besides... You know, the discontinued Heaven Hill six year that we've talked about, the bottom bond, um, you know, but you have all these, you know, bottom shelf whiskeys that are, you know, the Ezra Brooks, the regular Evan Williams and stuff like that. And 
I mean, nothing. No, if you're at, if you're below twenty dollars on a bottle of bourbon, and you love it, I think you've hit the jackpot. Yeah, like I mean, wine. The, the classic example is like Trader Joe's, like Charles Shaw, the two buck Chuck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, arguably that is bang for your buck, tough to beat, <laughs> especially when you're like hosting and stuff like that. People that don't drink a lot of wine. Yeah. You, you can have a decent bottle of wine. It's not gonna like taste cheap, if you will. Mm-hmm. It tastes like a decent wine, and I mean, it's not gonna taste necessarily like a. You know, sixty dollar bottle, but we always say that with cigars. Same thing with prices. You know, blind taste testing with whiskeys, with wines, anything like that. You do it, and you taste A or B, which one you like better. Well, I like B. It's like well, good for you because that one is seventeen ninety nine. The other bottle of you know whiskey for what you're drinking there is eighty five dollars. Yeah. yeah. So you just save yourself a lot of money on a daily drinker, in my opinion. Yeah, I think this would be a one to keep around the house, to be honest. Just for somebody that wants yeah. something cheap, and yeah. they may you know just. For someone that just comes over, if, or if they have a nice decanter from a family member, they bought one, just pour it in the decanter and leave it. Bowl of Fritos next to it, and you call it a night, man. That's that's, that's a, that's a so I'll ask nice. you this: you say a decanter for for bourbon and whiskey, like, what does that do to it? Because I know for wine, like, there's decanters, and like, I kind of know what that does. Does it do the same thing? Well, the funny part about decanters is it's really just for the appearance. Like, okay. it has nothing for. It actually, if anything, it actually probably hinders the whiskey because it's not a true cork, mm-hmm. so it's not completely sealed unless it's a really, really good decanter. Yeah, the high end one, you're gonna have that, you know, good yeah. seal to it. Yeah, yeah. and even okay. at, even at that, it's not gonna have a a watertight seal like something like this would. Um, you know, and I've actually I've actually tested that with mine. Yeah. You know, before with uh, I just put water in it and I held up held the you know, the glass cork on it and tipped it over in the sink and it was definitely not water tight yeah. or airtight. So, you know what I mean? That was a mess. Yeah, it was a mess. <laughs> but the good thing was water and it wasn't whisking and it didn't waste anything. But, you know, it's that, it's one of those things where it's purely for the the essence of it and the appearance, the, the appearance yeah. and stuff like that. So I, Everybody likes to have it look good. I have like a wet bar, you know. What, yeah, I, what I normally suggest is sticking something like this in that. So if you want to have a decanter that's sitting by, you know, on the, the stand by the TV or like just to have like class the place up if you if you must, I'd suggest something like this. You know, I mean, anything under 20 bucks or anything like that. So what are we smoking tonight? We're smoking a Camacho. <laughs> Just okay. <laughs> Gotta save it. So that's the other thing we learned. So everyone on Facebook Live, we're doing a quick save here. Uh, we lost one of our podcasts with, it just crashed. What? It was earlier on. And so like, it happened before, but it, we'd already saved it a little bit. But, bandwidth was not uh, there. And just mm-hmm. Well, it was right when I updated my computer and then updated to the new garage band. I was using the old one and it was like, they were, yeah, it was, it was a bad, bad <laughs> night. Bad night. Oh. <laughs> so we're smoking the Camacho, um, and it is Ecuador. an Ecuador, which is one of the newer ones. Um, so brief history on Camacho is, uh, it was actually founded by a guy named Simon Camacho, and then that, that was in 1961. He was from Cuba, moved to Florida, had some success there. And when he passed away in, I want to say around 1990, um, the Aroa family picked it up, who was based out of Honduras. And that's where they moved it from Nicaragua to Honduras. Um, the Aroa family, we've smoked some of their stuff, CLE cigars, um, Asylums, I think we've done. Yeah, we've done Asylums. Yeah. We had Nook on here. We had the Bone um, Crusher. That's not the... Damn it. But we did have the Bone Crusher, you're right. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong, but it's not... Uh, Aroa cigar. Damn it. No, it's all right. But um, the Aroa family, they, they, they ran with this company for some time. They did some amazing things, in my opinion, um, as far as how they, they developed their farming side of it. So they took it and they really ran with Honduran Corojo. We've talked about that, I think, in, in the past with Nook on here, is that yeah. the, they took the Corojo seed from, the, from Cuba and then they, they planted it. So they have true Corojo seed that has never been really altered since it was brought over from Cuba. Even the Cuban Corojo seed has been um, altered. A lot of times it's the Corojo 99. That's gonna be the year of the seed that before they had the blue mold scare and problems in Cuba, so that's why they always call it that. But uh, one of the cool things I wanna bring up about Camacho before we get to where these are actually manufactured um, 
is that uh, I think we talked about it with Nook on here, but I thought it was really cool to mention because when I was looking this up, it was mentioned on there is that they worked with a bear corporation on making it like a I don't know what you call it, but they you know, Dole Foods is, is yeah. on that same level. A bear, bear, B A Y. Oh, got it, got it. So it's it's this way of like this this um, not certification, but this level of, of farming and, and manufacturing that is. A, a green footprint. So if they take down plants, trees, or anything else, they plant other ones. I mean, it's, it's that clean of, an, of a of working environment. Wow. So they've been doing that for some time. Um, they then were actually acquired by uh, Davidoff, which that who they bought that out all the Camacho stuff from the Aroa family. They had kind of a I don't know if it was non compete or whatever it was, but they basically they they backed out of the game and then they came out with CLE cigars later on. They also were still producing the Camacho cigars. Um, along with that, though, it's it's interesting to me that when Camacho, that's why I wanted to bring this up, because they, they changed the branding completely. So if you look at Camacho cigars in the past, you would just have a, like a C on it with like a little triangle on top and triangle on the bottom. Um, if you look at this band on the, the left of the C and the right of the O, those kind of triangles were right above just a C, and it would say Camacho underneath it. After Davidoff ran through all of the product that they had and all the bands and they didn't rebrand it right away, they came out with these really bold bands. Um, How, what was the time frame on this? A couple years. A couple years. Okay. And then the Ecuador came out after that. Um, it's more of a medium bodied cigar. Uh, it's got uh, uh, Ecuadorian Habano wrapper, which is what that's what I call it, the, the Ecuador. Yeah. And then it's got a Brazilian binder, and then it's got the Honduran and Dominican filler. Cool. So it's a, a lighter cigar. I look, and you guys are only smoking. Have you smoked this before, Jake? Yeah, I love this. If you smoke it on its own, I think it's actually got more like floral notes to it. It's a little not sweetness, but there's a like I we were talking about things like shiny. Yeah. I always use like the term like higher pitch or lower like it's like a, not as rich, but it's it's a lot of flavor, but it's kind of like a more <laughs> floral. I mean, I it's, get it. so higher you, pitch. You, like well, that. it's funny when you say that. I, I think of like uh, like coffee brews, like yeah. browns and like yeah, yeah no, they a, little lighter. a lot of theirs. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's where I, I see it. Not shiny. Higher pitch. I still want to know where you get shiny from. I just think it, I think that was my interpretation of being lighter. I okay. mean, how can a cigar be lighter or higher pitch? Eh, I don't know. <laughs> he got it. <laughs> Kirk got it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you're stupid. Yeah. Yeah. It's normally how it goes. And I don't know for sure. We're smoking the box press, so if you're looking at it and, and if you see the picture, you took a picture of this, I think, for, for social media, but um, it's got the black background on the band. Typically, I'll show you guys, it's got just that teal on the original Ecuador. Can you um, explain to me why they do that with their cigars? Is it like box pressed and round? Like why they do like the, the black background and then they do the main color? Because they do that with the Corojo. Remember we had the- The Corojo and the Connecticut as well. They did box presses. These guys, I mean, so Davidoff looked at this as an opportunity, I think, to, to rebrand. The brand image we're gonna talk about tonight, um, they went really bold. And that was kind of what the, the Camacho name was known for. With the triple Maduro, the Corojo is really bold and spicy. Um, they were just kind of synonymous with this bold kind of cigar. Yeah. So they had the Connecticut, and that was called something different before, but the ones that were really popular were those. You know, the Diploma was all Corojo originally. When these guys came out with the Diploma, which was then discontinued, it was a four or five country blend. They completely reblended the cigar, too, and yeah. no one was happy with it. Because it was completely this different. This newest blend? No, the, 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 the one when they, when, oh. they, when they changed from just those basic C logos, old school, to these really bold uh, bands. The, the boxes that they come in are just this really high lacquer, like almost like uh, piano finish type lacquer boxes. Okay. They're, they're pretty, but they are completely off the wall compared to what else is out there. Uh, but also not gaudy. So they, they did a good job, and when they first came out, I, I gotta be honest, people were uh, really gravitating for them, towards them because when you're walking in a walk-in humidor or when you walk in a shop like uh, Tinderbox at Easton, you have the opportunity to like look at every band or in a walk-in humidor see these boxes. This is gonna stand out. They stand out. Like and they're done, good. they put enough, I mean, Davidoff's got you know, a ton of money, so it's like they put money into it so it doesn't look cheap. It's like a freaking rainbow. When you, like if you're looking at a Camacho case, it looks like a rainbow. Yeah, so I mean, you got that opportunity to, to rebrand all of this and really make it stand out in a different way. And I think that's what Davidoff was, was going for because... Well, what I was asking though is like, you know how we had the Corojos that were round and then the main yeah. la label was all red, yeah. right? And then, then the, the 
writing was in black. Yep. And then the box press were, the, the main label was black and then the writing was red. So what, is that just the difference between the round and the box press? Like what, because even on your picture that you had on the iPad was... That was a round Robusto. That was a round Robusto Ecuadorian Camacho. Yeah. And the main wrapper was teal and then the writing was black. I now did. on the box press it was black with teal writing. Stands out. I mean, they're like, what's different about it? Now, I was just I'm, curious what the point of it was. But. They, I honestly think they just were trying to put out a new product and instead of having it just run into so they, they do all this yeah so they got a scorpion Kirk's looking at it like what the why is there a scorpion because it, it's <laughs> badass man well it's on the inside so I don't know it's badass until I take it off so well it's on the outside too that's the stamp oh okay gotcha yeah, yeah yeah it's also on the back of a Camacho polo I have which is pretty cool too that would be pretty cool yeah, it is I mean but I mean so, so they do the black I want to say what they were doing and I heard they actually put a, a leaf of Pennsylvania uh, broadleaf in the filler, so they are slightly tweaked when they do the box press. That's two weeks in a row now we've had that. Yeah, so that's what I heard from the rep and everything, but um, I, I wanna say from a brand image standpoint, you release three blends in the box press, slightly tweak it, and you put it out, and if it had the exact same band on it, it was in the same exact color box as opposed to in, in, you know, doing an inverse version of it, it's just gonna not really hit. There's no reason to buy the new one if it's the same thing with box press. And you're just like, oh, I really like box press. No, you walk by and you're gonna say, well, I, I've had the Ecuador, but I haven't had the black Ecuador. You know what I mean? It's just basically people walking into a walk-in humidor or if they're being serviced like we do in center box, it's gonna stand out again. So you release that two, three years after you release these, these new banded and branded type of products. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're like, well, wait, 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 what, what's this one? Why, how is that one different than that one? Yeah. Well, it's kind of like Jim Beam with, even with this, you know, it's, this is different. It's a different whiskey, but, you know, you, they just changed the label and stuff where they did, you know, the regular Jim Beam white label. They did a Cubs, you know, commemorative label. They did a Blue Jackets one. I think they did a Boston Red Sox one. Yeah, that's just branding, supporting, and, and, and really maximizing your sponsorship yeah. in that, that market. I'm saying it's the same stuff, but just different label to stand out, you know what I mean? Because yeah. cause if you're a fan of one of those teams, you're going to buy it, and you probably don't even drink whiskey. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I drink whiskey, but I mean, Phil Davis, who's been on the show, he actually gave me one of those Cubs bottles, and I'm not cracking it. Yeah. <laughs> just like it won't happen. I might someday when I'm out of whiskey or something like that. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crack it, and I'm going to finish it. You mean you're not going to call your, your Uber, Uber Eats, I assume, doesn't do? Alcohol. They don't do alcohol, but I think there is an alcohol delivery service. I don't know if they do like hard liquor, but I mean they do beer and stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Amazon actually, I did order a uh, I did eighteen pack of Miller Lite one time. If somehow we could license that, right, man, that would be a billion dollar business. Oh yeah, for sure. Like there's some red tape there. <laughs> oh, a lot. That's why I said somehow. <laughs> when Camacho first came out, I, I will say it's worth mentioning. Um, it was with this new branding. They did this Torch It Up tour, and it was about a year or so into it. I mean, they went hard. When we're talking about brand image and that bold, really kind of like the Scorpion, like really cool stuff, um, trying to really push that image. They did this tour with like a, they had a big trailer on the back of this big F 350 or something like uh, F 250. It was, it was gorgeous. It was just all done up complete, badass Camacho style. They had a new brand ambassador. And uh, they, they came around. We had them at the, the Tinder box, actually. And we had about 100 people at this thing. And all part of this event was they had it completely done up. Not only did you have deals on cigars, they were at the end of the tour raffling off a Harley Davidson. Wow. That was a, a Camacho. So every event you had, one winner got in the finals, like one in 100 chance. Only. That's crazy. So, um, and it's funny that the person that won it was the night before our event in Indy. At the blend. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so, uh, but so they did that. We had everything from blind taste testing. So they would actually, like, they had a big table set up and they'd have like, it was like eight to 10 people that put up blindfolds and they did all that stuff. We did a uh, cocktail uh, contest. Basically, you had certain ingredients you could use and then you had to, you know, people competed and, and uh, they did make a cocktail out of what you were given. And uh, I was a judge for, for that, which was nice. <laughs> Most of it was nice. Um, and then they had an arm wrestling uh, competition. Jeez. I mean, it was it was all over the board. I mean, it was actually an extremely cool event, and I wish more companies did that. But I mean, I can only imagine.
imagine again what when we get into that brand image side of it, like what they've actually put into all all of the R and D on some of the stuff or what they consider that, you know, for as far as how to, to market this. And then also with something like that to just hire a guy to basically drive around the country and set up arm wrestling and cocktails and give away a Harley. I mean, that's a lot to kind of put your name out there that's already been out yeah. technically on the market since the sixties. Mm-hmm. So talk about brand image. I mean, they completely just flipped the script on it and went hardcore into it. Well, while we're on the subject, I mean, you know, like we said, Kirk, you're not like big into whiskey and you don't yeah. like cigars, like a lot. And so, you know, for someone that's kind of new to this scene, you know, based on these two products, the Jim Beam uh, repeal batch and the Ecuador, the Camacho Ecuador. Um, what do you? Would there be something that you would say? Yeah, I would grab that off the shelf. Out of pure looks. Yeah. Um. Honestly, it's it's funny. Before I came here, you know, I swung by the liquor store. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna I gotta bring something, right? So I just swung by, and honestly, that's what you would typically look for. Like, what what stands out to you? Typically, I know I look for price point. Like, hey, there's yeah. got to be like a, a threshold of you know this is gonna be quality or yeah. this is just gonna be pure shit. Um, but not surprisingly, when I looked at everything, a lot of the brand labels are really similar. Yeah. Similar, similar cup. There's nothing like this. There's not. You're not gonna find a turquoise. Yeah. Or like anything yeah. like that on any. Not a whiskey. Not never. Not a whiskey. Why not? It's gonna be black, red, or white. Exactly. Pretty much. Why? Unless you're like, not, but I'm bullet, yeah. bullet. I will say, bullet kind of changed that around where you got orange in there, and okay, just, yeah. just a orange band. That stands out, and it's kind of like a prohibition style bottle with like actually the writing etched into the, mm-hmm. or not etched but blown into the glass, and then so it stands it's out. A lot of subdued colors. You're absolutely right. I mean, it, it does have this kind of vintage look to it. I think mm-hmm. even like um, we talk about Weller. I mean, they have that. Uh, the reddish maroon and then you have the green and, yeah. but even those aren't just popping I mean like if you looked at the other Camachos Kirk mm-hmm. like the red is, is red yeah, yeah. orange is orange yellow the right red's yellow. almost an orange like it's yeah. a it's like a weird like what would you call it like sun I'd call it sunburst like red or something going Crayola colors yeah honestly yeah. Um, my color palette's not very good and I don't have a oh, we very big 64 or 128 you know like does it have a sharpener on the back of the Crayola? No. no. So you're sharp. That's old school. That's tough. Yeah, Does that sunburn? not... Is that... Is it sunburst or sunburn? Uh, uh, sunburn. Uh, does that not... Does, sunburn. You know, does yeah. it not, like, <laughs> speak that to you? Like, it's not just a red, though. It's so it's I like compare bright, it, though. They had the Corojo Maduro, which was, like, a, a darker red. So the red Corojo kind of popped more. So I, I guess I, I got it from the beginning. I'll say, like... If and the orange Connecticut is bright orange. Yeah, that that's orange. But, like, it, it's kind of like one of those things where... I, Regard, I'll take it to like Mopar colors, like the really bright red of Mopar yeah. is, is torrid red. I don't know. Like fire it. engine? I mean, is that what you're. Yeah, kind of. It's like a, just a gloss. Like, like Buckeye light red on the hat? No, it's brighter, brighter it, it's, than that. It, well, I'd say lighter. It's lighter than that. Okay. It's a weird. That's why I said sunburst because it's in between an orange and red. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you. No subtle differences. Now we're just colors. confusing Kurt. No, so I, I mean, <laughs> it's completely true. It's, you know, every this is why, thank God for technology, because now I can tell you, okay, this is the exact Pantone mix. This is, you know, your hex, like, code for, like, what your color is. Yeah. Because like, there's such subtle, I mean, like, now if you've ever opened up Photoshop or done anything like that, to where, like, you have, like, your gradient skews of, like, this is exactly what your color is. <laughs> Um, so talking about branding, I mean, just a subtle change in that yeah. will resonate well with the brand yeah. or will resonate well with the target audience that you're trying to appeal to. So like, I get why you change colors and I get why, you know, businesses that have been around that long have to rebrand, have to go through different iterations of, you mm-hmm. know, logos, colors, you know, I, I get it. Because, and when you design something though too, like when we were doing the BS shirts and stuff like that, like mm-hmm. our... Our designer had to tell the printer of the shirts or whatever we were doing, basically it was uh, the orange on our BS was, you know, it was like, what is it, R comma this number, and then it was yeah, like... Yeah, so you could do your, like, your RGB, and there could be another... It's it like just depends on yellow, I guess, but, I mean, yeah. like, it was, it was <laughs> no, one of those things, like, you can't just be like, yeah, I want an orange, because there's <laughs> a fucking hundred different oranges, 
and it's just those like on the gradient like you just kind of drag and click you know, yeah. click and drag and then you finally just stop <laughs> like that looks good but yeah. when you're actually trying to translate it to a product like a, a swag I item or something like you print item or something like that you're trying to tell someone well i want it to be orange and purple and like what orange and purple and like you know what scale are you using? Yeah, I mean, no, I'm they, sure there's one for, you know, there has to be some, you know, level to judge cigars or whiskey to be like, is this RGB, CYMK, is this Pantone? Absolutely. What are we using? Well, I'll throw one in the mix for you. Is like, I, I don't think whiskey companies use labels to bring people out. I think it's the bottle. I think they use both, but I see what you're saying. I yeah. think, but I think bottles the most prominent. You know, what I mean, like if you look at, we just talked about it the other week with High West. You know, High West bottles are, they look like a long cylinder that was yeah. actually blown. But it looks like blown yeah. glass because it's got imperfections and bubbles, bubbles in, in the glass. Yeah, and then you have stuff like Bib and Tucker that we did. You know, what I mean, like that's an old, yeah, just almost yeah, yeah. medieval style whiskey bottle where. The label is almost just non-existent, and then you just have a big, the the writing is blown in the glass, and it's it's. It's got a little small sticker on it. Yeah, and it's just got, it's just yeah. it's just brown it's just brown glass with a cork in it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I think I mean to to the brand side of it. I mean they they it's a full picture. Like I'm looking back at this. What is it? Waitness? Waffens. Waffens. I mean it's it's. It's calculated. I mean, yeah, you have a different style bottle on I think on this it. is more conservative, though, because of the fact that, like... I like that, though, because, it, you know, again, I mean, that's it's, it's what speaks to the different customers. Why do people buy what they buy? I mean, that's a yeah. big part of it is, is that's what you're doing from, from head to toe. Here's what they thought sure. about that wasn't even, like, maybe a marketing thing, but just, like, a consumer appreciation thing is the fact that it's got almost handled... The like, fact that you notice that is, it shows me that they, someone thought about it. Yeah, I mean that. I mean, because someone's gonna pick it up. Like, That's kind of cool. But think about that. Like, you have like, you know, it's a square bottle, so it's already awkward in your awkward in your hand. And then so, in you know, I, I actually do have small hands, but if you have, I'd say average size hands or whatever, like yeah. it, it's hard to. But imagine if that was flat. Like, is that not weird to you though? Like, that's much better than it is for putting your hands in the grooves than it is if you just held the square bottle, you know, from each side. I don't know. He's probably like restricted too. <laughs> well, like you say with cigars, they're handmade, man. Hand bottle, boom. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. I, I think what I got a lot of about, like when I was walking through, and you're asking me like what stuff stood out. I, I don't think I would have. And that goes into like, why are you buying? Why it? did you buy that? Exactly. Well, a, the, I looked at the price. Point. That's not a cheap bottle either. So thank you. Well, no, yeah. Well, I, here's this is just my gift giving period. Why would I give them something that they would probably either not buy because it's probably not good enough? Why not give them something that could be something that they wouldn't typically buy? No, I like that. Right? I mean... Well, you were dead on. Well, good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I look at it and I look for different things for different reasons. Like, if I was going to try something and I'm new to bourbon or whiskey, I might not go with the turquoise because I'm like, I don't know what that is. Like, that's pretty yeah. old. Like, I just kind of want to see what the true whiskey or bourbon's like. And so that's why... A lot of actually they don't deviate from it, right? Right. I think it's interesting, like when you're talking, like I've noticed this with cigars, right? Where it's, it seems there there's no ceiling on colors, branding, like the, like it, it seems that people really really go outside the box with cigars and different labels and how they do things, like Camacho with like a freaking scorpion. And like all the crazy <laughs> colors and stuff. Now there are cigars that are out there like Fuente and like the classics, you know, Monte Cristo yeah. that are just but look at the Espada, you know, you have that massive foot band on it that completely surrounds the cigar. Yeah. It's got crazy, you know, swirl. Yeah, but that's a bold presentation, but still classic in my that's traditional true. look true. to it. But this is not, and that's one of the things that like, cigars don't do where we're talking about whiskey, you know, all the the palette on colors is very slim. Mm -hmm. I like, so when Davidoff took over, acquired Camacho, I think the, the strategy there was, is they have, at the time, especially when a row family was still taking care of most of the production for them, it, you have good cigars, and they were doing well, but had slowed down a little bit, and they acquired it, they thought it was a good brand, I'm sure they paid the row family handsomely, and you, you were going after a new market, so they had a new 
new name brand that was recognized, but it was it was a new thing to their portfolio, which yeah. was more along the lines of that higher end stuff, like the Davidoffs themselves, the Griffins, and, and things of that nature. So now you, you throw in Avos as part of them too. Avo is, is part of that. So these very classic brand names, and then you bring in another classic brand name, Camacho, that was doing fairly well. But then you you bring in this bold market. You're giving away a Harley. You're having arm wrestling matches all over the, the country. Yeah, you're seriously. publicizing. I mean, so what does that tell you from the brand of what kind of? It's got a they, scorpion on it. They're you know Harley's arm wrestling. You're not just going after the bikers, but you're going after like the weekend warriors yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. That's that's it. I, I, I think I don't think it's a bad move, but I mean again, people buy for different reasons. So I mean again, to, to Kirk's point, it's like you walk in a, to a humidor, you walk into the the Bourbon Isle, and you don't know. Are you going like it's 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 a catch twenty two sometimes, you know? Because if you you go off the reservation with some of this marketing on and any product, and the price point looks too good to be true or it's super expensive, it doesn't matter what it is. You create I think you create doubt, mm-hmm. if, especially if you're you're trying to create a name for yourself. Because a lot of times, if you do that, it's, it's all right. Well, I used that one that we tried. I'm not dogging it. So I didn't care for it. Talk about corn was that Andy's number five? It's an Ohio one. Yeah. Very cool label. It was around fifty dollars. So I'm like, it's probably fifty dollars for a reason. Yeah. It's kind of a cool label. I haven't heard of. I'm seeing it in a lot of the liquor stores. It must be doing well. Yeah. And Is that be- primarily where you would see like if you're judging something and it's new because you guys are probably in there more often than me. You see it and you're like, oh, that's new. I think about trying that. Is that the first time that you run into a brand? Yeah, but the thing is now we're in the era of, of everyone's got a computer in their, their pocket. So, and there's a lot of blogs out there. There's a lot of review sites. There's a lot of stores that have reviews. So you can look it up before you even buy it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what, what I, I did. did. I'm like, I looked it up on the way there. I'm like, what's an average price range for a good whiskey or bourbon? Do you remember what it said? What do you mean? What it, what it said, what the price... Well, so price I was. typed... I, I, I went in there. Do this same Google. You guys can do this at home. I just typed in good whiskey, good bourbon. Yeah. And I scrolled through the top Google shopping. That's just a whole other thing. Can, you know, when we talk about branding and marketing. But scroll through there, and it'll tell you, okay, this is the top of the line. Good. All right? And you type in what's his average price whiskey. And you go through. And then from that, I like... Pretty much no. Like, okay, yeah, that's yeah. probably it. Hey, yeah. they're spending money on marketing. It's been around for this long. You can tell on the bottle. So, like, there's a lot of things that I, I, you know, I've purchased wine. So, it's just kind of the same thing. Different rules apply. Because this Wathen single barrel was around, what, that 30, 40 mark? Yeah, yeah. I think it was like 35, 32, yeah, something, yeah, like something like that. Something like that. So, so I, conservative. Yeah, but. I'm just saying, sometimes, you, you know, you see these that are, are priced high. And then you actually go on, say, one of those sites, and you look up Wathens or whatever whatever it is, and you like do a Google search. You do a search on, online for a particular bottle. Now you're entering in, you're diving into the whole, what I like to call like the blogger you know, world. Well, yeah, you're looking Everyone's for- got an opinion, mm-hmm. and then other people's opinions influence you know, their opinions, and then the next guy, and the next guy, and next thing you know, you could never buy this bottle because everyone's dogging it, Hey, it's a really like, you know, average price, you know, dog turd. So I yeah. wouldn't buy it. I'd buy this, this, and this over it. And so you never buy it. I mean, that's like the curse of, of, of a brand. Jeremy just, Jeremy Harmon on our live viewership just mentioned Castle and Key. You, yeah, which, you just keep talking about which it. Which Castle and Key is, they've completely renovated a, it wasn't a lost distillery, but it was a closed distillery. I don't know how much they spent, but they must have, must have spent a ton. And they rebranded completely everything and called it Castle and Key. They hired their the first female master distiller since Prohibition in Kentucky, which is pretty amazing. Um, and they it's in Frankfort, Kentucky, and it's basically just down in, next to the river. river yeah. The cool thing about it is it's an actual castle. So when, you know, old, old Taylor, when E.H. Taylor built it, he wanted that to be like his castle pretty much mm-hmm. so it, it, it still resembles that but they've gutted all the rick houses and the warehouses and put everything in has been aging it and everything um and that's i mean that when you talk about something you know branding where you've completely taken something taken something that 
was old and kind of forgot about and changed it and brought it back. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really amazing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's not, I mean, I, I'll hop on, everything you just told me there told me nothing about what it tastes, what the price point is, or is it good? Yeah. Right? Yeah. All that was brain story. That's all that was. And, and that's what I like. Yeah. You know, as if I'm not being the one who's actually developing it, if I'm not the one who's going through, you know, distilling it, and that's not me, all I can play with is the story. How it's presented, how I present it to my potential audience or the audience that I eventually want to reach. Yeah. And the one thing I can definitely say about, you know, cigars and just alcohol in general is I haven't seen a ton of it on any social media. Yeah. I mean, like I was asking you guys, like, is that where you run into it the first time? Is it gonna be in the store? What? Like or any cigars? Video? Yeah, like no. I, I mean, think once there... you have a passion for it, I think you're you're you uh, so social media. A big part of it is, and I just shared it again because we're kind of leading into the, the the marketing and then the brand image side of it. Is is um, I mean, we've been talking about it the whole time. Though, right? yeah, I know, but I, mean, I think yeah. we're 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 kind of just <laughs> evolving into the overall discussion. But I mean, with this, it's it's more focused groups. It's it's you're in a bourbon group, you're in a cigar group, you. You follow certain pages. Once you start developing a passion or an interest or a hobby in any of these things, yeah. you you know you follow different pages. You know you have whether it be Google Alerts or if you just have you know pages on your favorites that you go to. So I mean like cigars, halfwheel.com is one I go to a lot because they've developed into more of, more than just a blog. I mean they have they're like your news source for the cigar world. Yeah, and bourbons have much the same thing. I mean once you have that, it's, it's and that's word of mouth. There's just a lot of that too. There's a ton of bourbon. Yeah. Anymore, especially with the boom, you have like Bourbon R, you have Bourbon Review, um, you have Fred Minix, where it's like Bourbon Bourbon Plus and stuff like that. And these guys have made like a name for themselves just doing like bourbon blogs because they were within that that period where we're I I mean I, we're dead in the bourbon boom, and I don't it, it's not stopping anytime soon. I thought it was we don't know a year ago, but it's just it keeps ramping. Um, yeah. Every I mean, look at the sorry to go off on a tangent, but I mean look at look at the Steve knows that I go to these raffles. They're starting to do these raffles now where the state of Ohio is bringing in all these bottles. They've come under contract with these distilleries and instead of sending them out to and dispersing them amongst distilleries just on the slide chance that someone stumbles on it, they're doing actual raffles on it, so hundreds and hundreds of people go to one store, um, you know, one night a week, and you get a card and they, you know, call names out, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's going towards that because it's getting to the point where I like it and I kind of don't like it because it keeps the, I don't like it because it's, it's regulated and it takes away from, you know, I'll get nerdy and it takes away from the, the hunt Mm -hmm. of like trying to find you know something that you enjoy and that you like and you've been looking for because if you go into a liquor store and for those that don't know like there are a lot of people that actually do this where they travel and they go to every liquor store that they come across and they go in and see what they have mm -hmm. and they'll ask what's in the back because people start doing that like that's how serious it's gotten and you know and when you find something that you have been really really looking for it's like Christmas Day and it's, it's, it's a really, really cool experience if you're someone like me that is passionate about this stuff. But it takes away, from, these raffles take away from that. Here's the good part about it is, is that it allows the hookups mm -hmm. and all the shit these people have done. You know, they know a guy that hooked them up with, you know, all this Pappy Van Winkle and all these like limited release bottles and stuff like that. Yeah. It takes that completely away. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Because like I've I've been in, on both sides where I with cre created relationships, Dustin you know he used to be at a Kroger that had a liquor store, and still we get kind of hookups from time to time, but it's you know one of those things where it allows the the brands and everything that people want to try it allows them to experience it on a whim and everybody gets a you know shot everybody gets a equal amount of shots to get yeah that bottle at that place I think it's another form of marketing too I mean at that point it's you've got a limited product and I mean the, the
this is one of those industries, especially the bourbon side of it, where there's a huge secondary market. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing these raffles and things like that, I mean, I think it's all part of the creative marketing behind a lot of this. You know, if I literally say, hey, I've got this, this product that, you know, it may or may not be good, but it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. And also it's like, I call it our flagship bourbon. We're gonna call it Pappy Van Winkle. And it's uh, this much, but then all of a sudden, Within months, years later, it's like, yeah, it's that much, but you can't find it for that because somehow it gets in the hands of other people and all of a sudden it's now quadrupled or, you know, it's six times on the secondary market of what it is, retail, and, and yeah. now all of a sudden you've created a demand. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. talk about brand image, that's, that's, if you can, if you can accomplish that, it's, it's genius. Because if you're selling everything that you make at that point, you know, the cigar industry, it's, it's on a more everyday basis, it's like Padron. They don't have... Uh, traveling sales reps. They don't have anything that most of the other brands have to do. They literally, like, you have to call them, set up an account, and then if you want the anniversary stuff, if you want the 1926 series, if you want the 50 or you want the 85 or you want these limited ones, you have to buy all those other products. And But then when people come in, they, they sell, they, according to them, and I, I believe them for the most part, they sell everything that they make. Yeah. And they don't have anyone that's going out and pushing it because they've, they've created a brand image. They don't have to. They don't have to. They got people coming to them now. Yeah, I mean, it's, look it's at, amazing. Look at Willet, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's one of those places, Willet's a small distillery down in Bardstown, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And they've created a, com I mean, they have completely overhauled, I mean, the their distillery, everything that at the distillery, they've completely overhauled it because of the amount of money that they're bringing in. And you have people, I remember the last time we were down there, you know, the, the people that actually work there, I know they have to get annoyed because they have 10 or 15 people that stand outside every day just in case they release something because they're, they only release things like their family state bourbons and their like old bottles or their old barrels of rye or their old barrels of bourbon that are single barrels. They only release it on a whim. Mm -hmm. And the distillery themselves don't know that it's going to happen. So people just go there that live around there every day. Yeah, and you may get like a two hundred like. Here's what I do appreciate about Willet, is and it it kind of screws like the people that don't want to spend like good amounts of money on you know whiskey, but I understand why they're doing it. So they've ramped up their their prices because of the secondary market. So you know like you may get like I had a four year single barrel that I got at the distillery that was forty five dollars. You see five years that are single barrels on the secondary market, they go for $300, $400. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now the five and the six years are like 70, 80. You have 10 years that are at that 200 mark. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's insane, but I understand why they're doing that because it, because they're missing out on the money if people are willing to pay that. So that's, yeah, so that's, I mean, again, yeah, you get, you get into, I think, a, a slippery slope there because if they raise their prices enough, then they're going to, like, then you might have a backlash from the, uh, I don't know, I think, I think, you know, if you're spending that much uh, money for a $45 bottle and you spend $300, I think you're an idiot, I'm sorry, I mean, like, I saw some posts on some of the bourbon uh, groups lately about, like, podcasters, and I don't know how many of them are listening to this, but I mean, it's like one of those things, you know. Are they, you know, and you think these podcasters are really against that or whatever? And then there's some like, you know, comments below, like, well, no, I know this podcast, like, he does the same thing with his stuff. I honestly think, I mean, it's, it's cool. I mean, good for you guys to make money off of each other. But I mean, when it all comes down to it, it it's what you want to have. It's a hobby. And, it's, and people call it a passion. When you're, you're spending that kind of money for a collectible that you've got, it's just deemed that way and, and it, it, it spreads rampantly. Yeah. Over, over all these blogs and all these Facebook pages, all these, you know, whatever, bolts board, I don't know if they call them that anymore, I'm starting to sound old here, but, you know, it's one of those <laughs> things where I just, good for the, the distillery, but if they start increasing the price trying to match that, you might have a backlash, and be like, no, fuck those guys, they're, they're trying to take advantage of it, and it's like, no, you guys are, but if it's in their business model, you inch it up a little bit, hey, we're selling these all day long, every day, I, you could say that the, the distilleries might be annoyed by all these people standing outside their, their doors, if I had a business that I literally was like, hey, sometimes I put stuff out and that brings people to my door 365 days a year waiting to see, and I didn't have anything that day, and they might buy something else, or if they just go home, but I'll, hey, I'll see you tomorrow, Steve. 
cool. Yeah. Like I literally have people like on the edge of their seat every day out of the year because I am the hot ticket item. Yeah. You just don't want to piss them off. Mm. But I also see what you're saying where it's like they're losing out on it. It's like I'm putting out a product for 50 bucks and I know that these guys are, are literally doing it. Same thing with liquor stores that aren't state mandated. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. What's the point at that point? It's oh like, you know what? Fuck you guys. I'm just going to sell it to my brother. And then he's going to post it. And then we'll just split the profits. And, you know, we yeah. all win. Except for you guys. Because you guys are, I'm not trying to be insulting, but a bunch of idiots paying $300 for a bottle of whiskey that someone else paid $40 for. And if you don't know, Kirk, that's small money. Yeah. Too. When it comes to bottles of whiskey that are, like, up there. Interesting. It's it's really insane, honestly. I, I look at. The, I don't mean it like in a negative. Like a negative I do. I just think it's insane. insane. <laughs> hey, again, it's people buy for different reasons, and if it's just if you have the mean now, if you're going broke doing this and you're running up a credit card for it, you know, like the really rare bottles, or you're you know you're selling your car because you just bought three bottles of whiskey for like five hundred dollars a piece. There's an issue there. You are an idiot. But if you are, you know, living in a house that's paid off and, you know, your kids are in college being paid for and you're making six figures or more, seven figures, and you want to spend $500 on a bottle of whiskey because you're just bored and you have, you can't buy anything else right now that you don't already have, fuck, I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? Go ahead and do whatever you want, man. It's your money. I get it. But. I could talk about this all night. I really I could. But, but I think <laughs> for the branding side of it, I think it's, it's brilliant. You know it what I mean? Like, I don't need to make $500 off because I just sell what I have. I make a good profit margin, and I can make more, and I can put out more, more brands within the brand. I mean, it, it's a great business. It's I'll just incredible. dump all this stuff off on these guys, and, and they buy it right like, as soon as it comes onto the shelf. Yep, it's gone. I'll make more. Yep, at my pace. We've I, we've been all over the spectrum tonight. I think like so far, but we haven't got the chance for your to introduce you really. You know, to talk about like what you've done. What you've created, Kirk, and you know where you're kind of going. Yeah. And if you could, you know, for our listeners, you know, kind of introduce yourself formally and tell like your backstory and like how you started on the path of doing the the branding and the you know on my on the post we said you know brand specialist because yeah. I I think that's what you are. You've I've seen you create you know you know several businesses really you know. Either you were, you know, the, the advisor on it or whether it was your own. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of those things that is very valuable in talking about this. Um, so if you could. Well, I like the fact that you've been kind of like, I mean, I know you haven't been talking as much, but I mean, I, I can see your wheels turn as we're talking about the, the branding of, 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 especially two different types of industries that you are not familiar with. Yeah. But I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, parallels there as far as what we're talking about from a consumer standpoint. And then you're looking at it and you're like, yeah, I mean, all this stuff is pretty, pretty commonplace. Well, yeah, it's, it's common, but it's unique at the same time. Sure. So I'm always interested in it. And so like to, to kind of backpedal and give you, I won't really give you too much background on me because that's, I've just gotten to the point of where I'm at today because I've tried so many iterations of different businesses that have succeeded and failed and have so much in a short period of time that that experience has now become valuable to other people, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so that kind of brings we, us to like where we are today. And so anytime that I get to talk to brands, it's, it's great because all of these different brands, I'm like, okay, but how do you want to run your business? Sure. And that's where like the conversation starts. So like and people will hire me to do the photos and videos and then all of a sudden we do that and they give me as much context as they can about the brand, the better the context that they can give me about the brand the better I can probably produce the content that's going to... You have to know what you're marketing, right? Exactly. I mean, I mean, the product itself is is really what's... I mean, you can come up with this whole big, beautiful marketing and branding scheme as far as, you know, what the scope is. And then you actually find out how they're running their business. You're like, yeah, that won't work. Yeah. No, I mean, it's very <laughs> true. So yeah. it's, it's a relationship. I ran into that shit, too. Yeah. You know I, mean, I mean, it's... And there's, there's customers that I... That are off-brand for me. I talk about other brands that are off brand from my brand. I won't deal with them because it's not that the product that they're pushing is different. It's I don't believe that you believe that you're in the business for the right reasons. I like that though. And so it's principle. Yeah. And so that's brand. Um, that has a lot so, to do with brand. And a lot is. of people don't know that. 
And I think where we are getting to the point now where, you know, you have personal brands and that's huge. That's personal brands are influencers. You know, these podcasters that are going out there and telling people what they, you know, what they like and people are buying it because of that. Instagram people that have, exactly. you know, a million followers or more. And I love that because it's a new frontier for my industry and voice will become the new frontier for a while and then it's going to become... Bingo, Steve. You know, AR, and, you know, whatever. But Perfect. It's, voice. <laughs> it's great because that's just a new playground for me to work with other brands because it doesn't matter what brand it is. It's how am I going to spend this? Do I believe in the brand? If I believe in the brand, I believe in the product. Yeah. There's nothing holding me back. You can create a better... Exactly. And it's it's not even like creating the better brand. It's just connecting to the audience better than they ever have done before. Whether yes. that is through yes. the shape of the bottle, whether it's through the label, the content that you create, the influencers that you employ behind the brand, and then how the brand acts. Yeah. So I love it. And the easiest way for me to start telling people who are trying to develop a brand... If you're developing a brand, picture an avatar, but your, your avatar is a baby. And if you just launched, your brand has some personality, but not enough to be super interesting yet. Right? Yeah. And the longer that you can have that brand, you know, some of these brands, whiskeys and cigars have been around forever. So they have that story. Yeah. So guess what? Like a lot of it's family too. Yeah. And yeah. so you have family businesses like that and people oh, I have this family business. I'm like, oh, okay, you got six years of stories that I can tell and pitch to people that like, guess what? You can start tomorrow, but you're not going to have 60 years for another 60 years and they've already got 120. There's no catching up to that. And so I look at these brands and like, you just got to, you either got to stay in it long enough to become a front runner. Yeah. And then once you're out there, you just got to keep innovating. Yeah. And so that's where marketing comes in continually rebranding and reaching new people is it's just the name of the game well talk about the you, you just recently it was a year and a half or two years ago you started the makery company right so yeah in I, columbus ohio mm -hmm. so can you t tell us a little bit about that yeah so one of the biggest things that i realized in running your own small business and trying to get it up off the ground is like a i don't know anything and b it's like expensive if you don't know anything because you have to hire everybody to do it right yeah. okay whether it's Technical support for a podcast, buying a laptop, buying a mic, starting a website, all of that stuff. Yeah. You either have to learn it or you have to pay for it. And after running all of my businesses, success, successes and failures, I started to realize that the agencies that are out there, I'm like, you guys are greedy as fuck. Really? Like, oh, yeah. How like, so? There's no way. All right. So tell me right now what you would consider a good per hour rate for just an average person. Like if you were like, Hey, I made X amount of dollars per hour. I'd live comfortably. What, what sounds good to you? Like, what would you guys say? What, 22 an hour. In close Ohio, I think, you know, in the, the twenties is a comfortable living, but it's certainly, you're still, you're yeah. still pushing it. Okay. I mean, I'm talking like probably. So what kind of lifestyle does that buy you? Um, do you think? At least here in Columbus. Yeah, it's not eating out. It's it's maybe saving up for a house and, and driving an average car, and, and you're, you know, you know, you're not like I said, you're not eating out. So you're cooking for yourself. You, you may go out to eat once a week. You're not necessarily you know smoking cigars and everything else if you're going to be saving as well. But if you have a family and you're in the twenties, I yeah. think you're. I mean, you're probably in trouble. You're probably like trying trouble. to make it. You're yeah. trying to make it work, right? I would say so for a comfortable. Like when I think of comfortable, I'm not talking like super extravagant. Yeah. But like you don't really have to try. Mm -hmm. You're you're pushing probably hundred thousand a year. Yeah, six figures. Yeah. Okay. At least you know, and it depends on, on where you're listening. You know, here on the on the, the, the episode here, but. I mean, if you're in Columbus, Ohio, I think if you're making around six figures, you sh unless you live beyond your means, which that's the other thing that a lot of people don't realize, is that the more money you make, a lot of times the you're, you're living within your means. So the like more if, money you, you spend. Yeah, if you make $50,000 a year, you make that work the best you can. You make $100,000 a year, then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're buying more expensive things, you're eating out more, you're doing, you don't think about it. Like I said, my roommate orders McDonald's breakfast through Uber Eats <laughs> on some mornings where he doesn't feel like getting in his car and, and getting it. Yeah. And it's two miles down the road. But so he's got like, that kind of money and he's it's, got that kind of it's money. just him. And there's plenty of people that don't have that kind of money, but their credit card works just fine. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, that's it. I decided in the beginning, I'm like, 
okay, you know, maybe you're starting your own business and you're just to try, trying to decide how much you're going to charge for your service, how much you're going to charge for your product, right. much of like kind of the price points we talked about tonight. What makes sense? That's like how I finish almost every email. What makes sense? Yeah. What makes sense right now? What makes sense next year? Right? Well, I decided my wife's a nurse and she makes, you know, let's just say $25 an hour. Yeah. It's pretty good. Well, she had a degree and she has debt. Yeah. So... Yeah, you got, you're making twenty five dollars an hour. A quarter of that is spending money. Yeah, and you're paying Maybe. for you know Maybe. taxes, health insurance, living a life. So there's not that much left over. If you were living at home, yeah, sure, you'd have a little bit extra spending money. Yeah, and I just had you know being in these industries, whether it's web design, photography, videography, you're looking at these people where if they're actually charging per hour what they're actually doing, average is like one fifty. Mm. $150 an hour. Billable hours. Billable hours. That's crazy. Yeah. I would love to get there. But guess what? If I'm doing that, I'm working for brands that don't give a shit about their brand. Right. I'm, I've done some this past week where I'm working for big brands and I'm just not working one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one with the owner and it doesn't mean anything. You're just talking to the, his assistant. Yeah. And we're just, you know, we're doing... It could be the budget for this campaign could be twenty thousand dollars, and right. they're just like they're, they're they don't need an ROI on this. They just need it done. Yeah, you know, just quick and dirty. Thanks for coming. And yeah, did good work. And it's just what I call a one off. Yeah, and maybe I'll get them later. We'll come back. We'll do something. That's how Alicia was talking. You know, my girlfriend mm -hmm. is with the Snap Ed, you know, the marketing team at OSU, mm -hmm. and she told me that they paid. You know the the videographers and photographer yep. for the recipes and the food and how they had to hire like fucking hand models. Yep. And I'm like, you could have paid me half that. Exactly. You could have paid me a quarter of that. Yeah, you said you have small hands. <laughs> I fucking hate you. <laughs> I'm just trying to I mean, be. You can roll back the tape if you want. No, I so, did say that. I do have small hands. You know what I mean, though? Exactly. I know what you mean too, Dude, yeah. you're, they're just blowing the budget. <laughs> that's, that's offensive. And so it's crazy to think that I could say. In the beginning, right now, I charge $35 an hour for website design. That's yes. really low. And yeah. he kills it. I'll say and that I, to yeah. anyone listening. I'm, I'm working my way up there, but yeah. I'm looking for brands that I resonate with, and I want to grow with them. Because I believe not only in those brands, but I believe in, believe in my ability to help them grow. And so I kind of tie our two ships together, and if they grow, I grow. Well, it's interesting that you're, you're, you haven't mentioned it. it so you, you specialize in, in, in branding and marketing and, and you, <laughs> the different facets of that. But all the while, what I'm listening to as you're, you're, you're discussing that, you're, you're explaining that, is that you haven't really discussed on how you marketed and branded yourself. Because you, you are giving the, the gist, like the, the overall, I guess, personality of what you're doing, you know, as far as what your, your, your mission statement is in a matter of, of speaking. But at the same time, it's like, how do you get your, you know, like, I'm going to help you, but it's like, you also are in the meantime, building your own business and your own, you know, brand and everything yeah. else. So it's, it's, it's not ironic, I guess. That's not the word I'm looking for, but it it's, is it's very, you know, relatable. I'm doing the same thing, but I'm doing it for other businesses. And at the same time, I have to do it for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so this is what a lot of creators struggle with is marketing themselves. And I, if I guarantee, go to my website, I hate it. I hate my website. Why? Develop, just because I know it can be better, and when it's your own, you know, craft, you're like, well, fuck, I can do that better. Do you mind saying what what what's your website? Oh yeah, it's, it's just themakerycompany.com. Go there, check it out. I literally already have a beta version that I'm working on as another iteration of it because what I do is complex in the highest demanded skill, regardless of whatever industry it is. It's having a high level of expertise, but being able to simplify it so somebody's able to digest it yeah. and agree with it, purchase it, like it, you know, whatever brand it is. And that's like what I've always tried to do is like simplify, simplify. And everybody starts just getting way too complex. These big brands, yeah, I need to go out and hire a hand model. Maybe. I doubt it, but. Is it in the budget? Yeah. I mean, these are questions you have to ask when you're actually doing it with a, a head on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. I love you you bringing that up though because it's a major I think a major flaw mm -hmm. because you see a lot of people that a lot of these big businesses that they do hire hand models and want everything to portray to be perfect and I understand you know because I was kind of 
you know, I was kind of in that yeah. industry too for a little bit. And it's like, I, I felt the same way with the business that I was, you know, with and how I wanted to see it run. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really about me, but how I branded myself was through the work. Yep. Like through the videos, through the photography, because that's how I think when you're talking about like a videographer, photographer, what you do, a, a creator, mm -hmm. really, you, it's, if you brand yourself through the creative work that you produce. Well, that's a classic portfolio on an artist. Yeah. Yeah. When you're trying to get into a program for schooling or you're trying to, you know, sell to another client. Hey, I, I've worked with these. These are some of my previous. It's your portfolio. That's what you're talking about right there. Yeah. You're building, yeah, exactly. you, your brand is your portfolio, your works. Yeah. And I mean, like for the longest time, like when I was doing like the, the fitness thing and, you know, my thing was like win the day. Yeah. And then I met Zach. Mm -hmm. Humble, you know what I mean, and yeah. his thing was win the day. So it's like, Fuck. yes. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't really that, <laughs> but it's kind of like one of those things. Like, oh, that actually brought us together. Yeah, and that brought us, you know, closer because it's like, well, we have the same mantra. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's not really even if it's like a mantra or a motto, you brand yourself within that. Like Steve, yours is focus. Yeah. And regardless of if you think or if you have, the, if you well, don't the first think, form put out a post, I agree. Yeah, I saw it. You know what I mean? Dude, that's like twice my size and. You know, he's talking about focus and he explains it so well. I'm like, God damn it. Yeah. It's but I just appreciate it. You know, I appreciate it. It's kind of like one of those things. It's, I think I'm jealous. Main, I think the main question, though, for like our listeners oh. is, is how, how do you brand yourself? Like, what are the steps to go about branding myself? What do I do? Like, how do I want to do it? You know, I think those are the big questions that our listeners, if they want to do that, and do their own thing. They need to ask themselves Before we that. Dive in yeah. that though. I, I the the whole hand model thing. It, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 what I'm, what I'm thinking about because uh, so I, I wanted to comment because when I was at at, at the moving company, two men in a truck. One of the things that I really stuck with, it, what really stuck with me was when we're talking about like in the office. A lot of times when we were residential mainly, but some commercial movers, local, but then we were doing interstate. They've grown, grown, and grown. But it's you know at a certain point, like what puts trucks in driveways. Yeah. Or in, in, at the end in of the day, you have to make sales. You, that, that's, sales fixes everything. I mean, you can market the shit out of it and brand yourself, but if you're not actually putting product into consumers' hands, then there's no point in doing it and you will fail. True. You're going to fail. So when I think about, um, you know, I thought about a cigar brand when you guys were talking about, when you were talking about this, Kirk, and then when you're talking about the snap ed thing, what always has been ironic to me about what Alicia's doing with these really, you know, high-end videos of recipes and with hand models doing it and these like high-end, you know, videographers doing these like you see the food kind of getting you know, moving across the table and all this shit. And what are they actually putting out? Who who are these recipes actually for based on what their their who is their their audience? Their low income housing. What the fuck do you need a hand, a hand model when most of these people are working that's on like food yeah, stamps? That's what I told her. Are you so, kidding me? Like, yeah. are they? I mean, first of all, they have to be online looking at this stuff, and on the second second side of it, it's like, uh, is it because of the hands look really neat and the food's dancing across the table, or do you just want to have someone like saying like, hey, give me you know a, a time lapse. This is step one. This is step two. This is step three. And it's like what we're doing with this podcast, where it's. You know, right now it's three guys sitting in a garage talking. It's like, there's no fancy, you know, uh, editing going on or anything like that. But this is like the raw part of it. You know, I, you said that before the podcast. That's the raw side. So if your consumer is something that is not supposed to be flashy, when you, your, your clientele is, is that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with branding, I feel like when I think about like what puts trucks in driveways, if a potential customer walks in and I've got this super fancy desk, got a flat screen on the wall, you know, our office is like in this high-end business, you know, warehouse district. And they're like, well, no wonder you guys are more expensive because yeah. look at all look this. At your overhead. Look you know, like overhead. everyone's driving these high-end cars. Like the, the guy that's, you know, giving me an estimate just pulled up in a Benz. Like, yeah. what the, like no wonder you're more expensive. What do you, I mean, that's what we're talking about whiskey. Like when you talk, yeah. when you think of whiskey, it's like we're talking about how bland the, the marketing is behind the, and it's not really bland, but the color scheme, you know what yeah. I mean? Well, who are you marketing to? You're marketing to grandpa and maybe People his, have his son and then his son. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, in, you know, it, it's a, it, I don't want to say it's a grungy-esque yeah. thing, but it's it's an old time. Well, it's something that you style. would like take pride in. You're like, yeah. I take pride in that label. Like, Look yeah. at old school. Mm -hmm. Look at old school gym. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's literally nothing if you didn't know about it. And then you walk in there and it's, 
It's kind of like what we talked about the, the tender box too. It's it's yeah. the people it's that. Nothing, well, it's not nothing, but it's a, it's a small <laughs> room. It doesn't have a big lounge area, but it's the but it has a lounge area. It has numerous cigars, over four hundred and fifty, right? Yeah, yeah. And but the people and the camaraderie and mm -hmm. and the community that backs it's just that the relationships business. that make the brand. You've created yeah. that brand. I That's would compare it, that to a, a like the church is not a building; it's the congregation. Mm -hmm. Is the way I look at that type of thing. Now you still want to have a place to gather comfortably and worship, or gather comfortably and yeah. smoke and, and have a community and have fellowship of any any side of it, but. Um, I, I just, yeah, I wanted to kind of jump in. But, but yeah, I mean, it's like the kind of thing. It's like, you gotta, it, it's, it's your brand image, and, and you can, again, you can do all this stuff, but if you're not actually translating and have that common thing, maybe you're going to dive into that. But, you know, I think of a, a certain cigar brand that they're all over the board. They, had a, they have a family story, and then all of a sudden they like rebranded away from that, and then you're looking at their new ads and their social media and their cigar labeling, and you're just like, why did you go away from that? Because as a retailer, I was able to sell the shit out of your stuff with your, your family story <laughs> yeah. and these classic brands. And then all of a sudden you got like this all like different, just like fucking throwing darts at a board. Be like, oh, let's try this one. And like, no, at the same time, let's do this one. And like you, you see two see ads it. come out and you're like, so what are you selling? Like, you know, there's no universal, like from start to finish, this is the brand and this is who we want to reach. Mm -hmm. And all encompassing throughout that path, successfully doing it from a business standpoint, obviously, so you're doing it financially well, so you can stick mm -hmm. around and grow. But like, how do you get to that point without you know going all over the board? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's. I think that's where my business experience plays into my brand, right? Not many people. I I want to brand the bakery company to the point where everybody that I'm, I employ had to. Have, try the business or yeah. own a business to work for me. Okay. Why? Because I don't want you going out and hiring a hand model to blow a budget. I want you to spend that $250 like it's the last $250 that that brand or that company gave us yeah. to make them more money. That makes sense. And so I like that. when you do that and you've had that and you're resting all of this on there, yeah, I'm completely transparent. Like, Guys, this could be, if this is your last 250, this could be your last 250. But if you want to take another go at this, I'm the first person you call when you come back to this. Yeah. Go work your job, save a little bit more, we'll come back. I'll tell you exactly how we're going to do it. And most of the time when I talk to these brands, it's, it's taken me eight months. Officially, like when I, I think I submitted it, it was eight months. Yeah. But it, since that eight months you have to let your customers go through with the life, the lifetime value of your customer. Like the longer you've been around, the longer that you can have customers for that long. Yeah. And it has to run a certain course to the point where I was just giving advice to certain brands. I'm like, this is what I would do. And once you can afford me, not expensive, but they couldn't afford me. Once you do this, I think that's going to make you enough money. As soon as that makes you enough money to hire me, hire me, we'll grow from there. Yeah. And that's what I said before is like, you got to do it dirty. Like if you never go for, through that, if you never have any scars, if you never have any, what I call tissue paper filters on you know, my lights is that what to diffuse the light. You guys don't need it. There's, there's enough diffusion. In no, here. we just have a flower pot holder yeah. there with a light to keep Steve's face lit. So <laughs> I, I look good too though. I just want to say, oh, you all look, look good on camera. You all look pretty good. Um, <laughs> But I, I just hate when people get super fancy and then I, I look at brands that grow and when I start to see what's called, I would call it negligence in running your business when you do stuff like that, when you're not taking care of not just your customer, but your employee first. Like, is this brand stable? Can I make my employees better? And then you have this decision of, am I the small giant? Like, do I stay privately owned? Do I optimize the business? Because at a certain point, you're only going to make so much more money and add so many more problems. Right? It's a very good point. Absolutely. You know, you know, I can talk a lot. Yeah, about that, exactly. But, I mean, and so I, that's been my experience, and that's been how I want to run my business. I mean, all the brands that I work with can be all over the board, but I'm going to be a small group of very specialized individuals who you would pay an exorbitant amount of money to help, and like. 
if I can make a good living, and I charge more for like photos and videos because I have overhead that I need to pay. Yeah, absolutely. But that goes into how responsible were you in growing your brand and running your company yeah. to reach your target audience at the right price point. That's it. Yeah, I mean, again, you branding yourself and marketing yourself. Here's, you know? here's what I like about you, Kirk, and that's why I wanted you on here when we talked about this, is that, you know, I, I reached out to you and talked about like audio. And, and how we could somehow run our audio system and our Facebook Live while having someone call in. And, and then you gave, off the rip, like within a day, you gave me a, you know, kind of a synopsis of what you thought or what, and you, and you picked my brain, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a consulting thing. And then on top of that, you also gave your feedback on it. Yeah. And then, I mean, and, and I haven't like, we haven't really paid you anything. Yeah. Now, I do, however, think that this is really good for you, too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, there's, where there's where definitely like, so we got one of our listeners, Pat Stiles, who's a big part of the, the uh, bourbon community. He, his comment is your website. Yeah. What about it? Just, just, he just put it out there. Oh, okay. Yeah, so well, he just put it out to the viewers. Oh, Pat thanks, Styles man. on there. So okay. that, that's, what, that's what's great about, like, I think, our community that we, we t we're talking about branding where it, it, we're actually creating a community yeah. first, I think. Yep. And I think that drives a brand and, you know, to its length. I think it's what develops the brand. You, yeah. A lot of people that bring a product to market, it's great, but like, was there an issue? Were you the only one that had that issue? Yeah. Because there's a lot of times that I see products that are like, I'm like, that's a great branded product, but there was no real need for it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I, I've seen it around a lot of times and it sucks. And you learn that on the back end after you spent tens of thousands of dollars. But that's iteration one. I mean, I looked at myself and I knew since probably high school, I was like, at some point in time, I'm going to own my own business. Yeah. It's going to happen. And now I went through all these steps of being what I would call financially irresponsible with running a business. I, you know, I'm just like any other consumer on the like on the market. I want my brand to be great. I want it to look good. And you want I the want, best shit. I want the best shit, right? But then we just talked about, okay, at what point does your microphone cost so much money and deliver a marginal return? Right. And so that's, I think, where I now can come to somebody and be like, I use $200 lights from Amazon. And these are the diffusers I use from the other lights that I bought. Yeah. If you see the behind the scenes, it looks pretty tacky. You see the final image and you're like, that's spot on, man. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go with that. Yeah. And that's what I want. I want people, and it's not that I'm like staging it up to be like that. I tell all my clients, I'm like, hey, this is how much it's going to cost. Wow, that's great. Like, that's because I haven't spent all this money on this equipment. And, you know, if you can financially run your business smart, then you can go through and in, in, in the end and hire a hand model down the road. If I'm having yeah. so much success, yeah. yeah, that's fine. But then you might lose touch with your customer base. You might lose touch with your brand. And that's when you kind of go all over the market. You know, like you were saying, just throwing darts at a board, trying to find that target audience again. Yeah. Because you've gone through a cycle of what your brands run. Yeah. I, I don't think, like, I, we have a lot of experience in this, but, like, speaking on, upon, like, the, the podcast, for mm -hmm. instance, I think we're both in the same boat where we say, you know, when you're starting something, it, it's most important to be real at the beginning. Oh, yeah. Where, you know, and we have been completely transparent with the people that listen to us. And we haven't made, you know, we have a couple of sponsors, but we haven't made. And that's a, great. I don't know many spot. I don't know many podcasts that A, maybe ever gone out and asked for a sponsor. Right. You got to do, you got to learn how to do that. Yeah. You got, I mean, you, you work your way through it. I'm sure in the beginning you're like, oh, this is going to be our name. I think our logo should look like yeah. this. I think this is the way that we should structure it. And 10 episodes later, you pretty much just throw that shit out the window. And this is the way that well, you get happen. drunk and you get in a, an <laughs> argument. <laughs> That's the best part. You, and like, then three days later, you talk about it and you take like bits and pieces from it of what you remember of the argument. And yeah. then you're like, yeah, no, I think we can grow up with it. Yeah. And to be honest, like that's the, how it works. yeah, and to, and to be honest, our very very first episode wasn't supposed to be a recorded episode. Yeah, we just we had like four guys in here, and we went off the cuff, and we were talking about names and stuff like that, and you know we we had like three or four of them, mm -hmm. and then we started it, and I said, hey everyone, you know this is the Bourbon and BS podcast. Yeah, and so it just 
You know, it, it, it was it. And, and, and we were talking, you know, we went into details about how we thought, like, we don't always want to do a bourbon every week, and we haven't. Um, I think that's the, the, the main majority of what we have, you know, sampled and stuff like that. But when it's in the name and then the BS is because of, you know, Brian and Steve with the BS Cigar Company, so we want to pay tribute to that. And the bullshit part. Yeah, that too. So it's kind of like a funny yeah. play on words. Yeah. And then, but but it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, no, it, it just fit and that's how we felt. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think a lot of the times you're talking about Kirk where, you know, these main, these big businesses take all this money and, you know, they, they set out a budget for marketing, right? Mm-hmm. And then they they feel like they need to spend it all on, in my opinion, dumb shit. Where it's, or and to over, you it's dumb. Yeah. To them it could just be they don't know any better, and that's what I run into. I, all right, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean I think a lot of times I think that it, it's again what is the goal of the business? Mm-hmm. That that's where it all starts. What what is it? It's not just a, it starts as a concept and idea. It's sometimes at different at different levels of growth. It's hey, the, I always say, like, would it be cool if yeah. we could do this? Like yeah, it would be cool, but we aren't there. Like we don't have the, the yeah. resources to to do that. So it would be cool, but we're not talking about next month. We're talking about five years from now. Mm-hmm. And then you basically like again from your standpoint, branding and marketing and, and actually structuring this as a plan. That's a lot of times where from the business standpoint, it's if we want to be here. And say you set it as a three, five year goal, whatever it might be, and then you work backwards from it, you might hit that goal earlier or maybe later, but I mean, as long as you're growing towards that and adapting along the way, we've had podcast episodes about that as well, just in life and in business and relationships. But I mean, that's, that's a big part of it is that you actually have to have a product that to you, as you even said it, that you believe in when you have a client. Mm-hmm. But have you had that client where they just absolutely are at that, would it be, wouldn't it be cool Type thing, and then you're just looking at them like, yeah, yeah, but we're you're not you're not there, yeah, you're not even close to there. Like we we need like to we need to have a website, yeah. Like your website's shit right now, and you're trying to direct all your traffic based on what you guys sat around before I walked into your room and mm-hmm. your business, and you you said, hey, we want to direct all our, our traffic to our website, and you look at your website, and you're like, why? Yeah. What why, why do you want them looking at that? Because there's no information, and that's like a uh, an ending point so you, you yeah I can get all sorts of traffic to your website but they look at it and it's only information they can't buy anything they can't do anything they can't do like it gives your address and a you know yeah. story about your company and then it's like they look it up and they're like great mm-hmm. I, I, I don't even I don't really want to go anywhere further they look at your your competitor for example on whatever it might be whatever the widget is that you're selling yeah and they have an e-commerce page and they have, you know, click this link to, to talk to a representative right now, you know, click this to do this and that and all stuff. And it's like, you guys are not even close to be able to do what you want to do on sales goals and, and your, your reach as far as your demographics, because you're not even where you're not close to even just what your mission is right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you've been in those instances where, you know, I, I was in the same instances with the company I was before. And you know that where it's yeah. like. You give advice like that when they're asking you a real question, you try to be real back, mm-hmm. and they're kind of like, well, that's not good enough. Yeah, and you get that, and that's that's the luxury that you get is being an entrepreneur who's run a business where you can say no. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, that's it. You, If you work for somebody else, you get to say no less. Like, it just happens. This It's a sliding scale, right? And someone else has the ultimate yes or no. Exactly. Yeah. And so, for example, you, you were kind of talking about, you know, who has the final say here? Like, is this a good idea? Is this not a good idea? I've had a business where I had multiple business owners and I didn't get, I had my say is what I believe in. But at the end of the day, I have two other business partners. If they outvote you, yeah, you're done. And I think something to be said with that is when I came away from that scenario, I go, I, I will never have another business partner ever again. Yeah. That was my initial thought. And now that you know time has passed and I look back at that, I don't necessarily agree with that because if I hire an employee, I want them to be well taken care of and I want them to treat that, you know, the business as it's, they have a vested interest in it. 
there's that dynamic there that we've talked about before on, on previous episodes where yes. it's like they work for you, but also more importantly, you work for them. Exactly. Even though you're the one signing the paychecks, you're the one that's you, maybe the ultimate yes or no, but why would you hire someone to just say no to them all the time or have them say that classic yes man type thing where they're constantly just agreeing with you? They're, they're you might as well just have an assistant to just, you know, do your dry yeah. clean and, and, we just and do what you want. We talked about it last week with Miguel where it's like, do you want a... Do you want a loyal employee that's going to work hard that you pay well, or do you want a a loyal employee that's not going to work as well because they know that the shit that you pay? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? No, I I completely get it. Within and, within means, right? Well, yeah. We're not talking about. I mean, nobody means. nobody's ever going to work as hard as you when you own your own business. No. So the first employee you hire is never going to work as hard as you, and they're probably never going to do what you want them to do as good as you want them to do it. And one well, of the things, depends on your personality type too. Very true. Very true. And there's things that they're gifted at that I would never be able to do, and that's why I hire you. Yeah, you, you yeah, you absolutely. So surround yourself with people with skill sets that hopefully will will or you know how to relate to them, but also that that complement your weaknesses in a sense that you know you're better at this based on what I know of you through the interview process, the portfolios, the resumes, all that stuff. That, that basically you are going to build me up because I know what my weaknesses are. Mm-hmm. You're a creative guy running a business. That is not a good classic scenario that it's you not, create and be the business owner. Because you just said it yourself. You're on your own right now and you've got a good product that you're putting out to help other people put up good products. But at the same time, you are constantly struggling with yourself. It sounds like you're, you're a bit of a perfectionist or you're constant, constantly striving to to better your your offerings to your clients. Mm-hmm. And so you have that inner struggle in a sense of always trying to improve yourself and like you've got this beta version of your website, you got these, you know, these thoughts of what you should be doing, but I'm not there yet. Like so you're you're constantly doing all that stuff. Creative people a lot of times are great business starters, but if you don't surround yourself with people that run businesses well, <laughs> or you can't bring in a specialist to brand your your, your yeah. brand in, in a sense you can't give the image to your brand and you think you're always right it's, well, it's yeah. a disaster you have to have like is everybody always it's it's the self awareness and then it ha- you have to be real so like you can quote here's a couple things before I forget about it if, if you're thinking about starting your brand or you thinking like you've lost touch with your brand or whatever Simon Sinek has a book called Start With Why. What was the name again? Simon Sinek. Okay. Um, you've probably seen him on a lot of videos. Uh, he talks about, a lot about like the millennial generation. I think he's a psychologist is primarily what he does. He articulates things so well. Okay. Like he's just great. But the book, um, Start With Why, really, why? Why are you doing this? Who are yeah. you serving? And if you start with that, it's a great book. If you're in the middle of your business and you're like struggling, I've read it. Um, it's called uh, The Messy Middle, and that one is great. Uh, I've probably listened to it five times. I listen to audiobooks and podcasts. I thought you were going to say from good to great. From, from good to great. That's a classic one. That, I mean, I, yeah. You don't like I've it? read it. No, I've read it. I've yeah. read all of them. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. one thing I will really say is all of those make you question yourself, and if you don't ever question yourself, you're probably, uh, you know... Steve Jobs, you're probably a dick, and yeah. you probably impose a lot of that kind of stuff on people around you. Something I've heard of recently is have really strong opinions that are loosely held. Wow. And I heard that, I'm like, yeah, I will believe in this opinion until I think I've found something that's willing to change it. But I, I like, I mean, there's a value there, like that kind of goes back to what I was trying to make a point of is, is that a guy like Steve Jobs, yeah, I mean, he has that, 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 uh, I guess that, that persona. Yeah. The persona basically, you know, the, the history of, of him was, yeah, like, I mean, it was like, he was kind of a dick and he was very, very demanding, but he did exactly that. He surrounded himself with people that could, could do that. And he pushed them to do, but he was a perfectionist, which, you know, over the years and where Apple went to, in a sense, you know, the product started eventually after all the trials and tribulations, when it, it finally reached the market, I mean, that was the stereotype with Apple products versus like <laughs> Android and, and like Dells and stuff like that on computers. They were advanced as far as hardware and stuff like that. I mean, you look at the specs, you know what I mean? It's, it's great. Yeah. yeah, but like his whole thing was, is like, yeah, but when a consumer has it in their hand, 
it works mm -hmm. and it works for a, a longer time which is a terrible business model if you're trying to put out a new technology, yeah. you know, technological uh, piece of equipment all the time. But I mean, it's one of those things where it's like it want, it, we want it to work. Elon Musk recently, I, don't, I think it was like that thing where he said, you know, when people said something about it was a, it was a tweet that he had, and I'm going to uh, butcher this, but it was essentially that, you know, about going to like Harvard and everything like that, yeah. like doing all that. And he said, you know, about business owners or, you know, people in charge, CEOs, that, you know, yeah, you don't always have to go to, to Harvard. But he hires people, people that work for him went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. So it's like, again, it's, it's that, that, that it's creative profound. side, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, you have to surround yourself as you grow, but you have that, you know, you surround yourself with people that actually have the skill sets that you need to accomplish, again, from your why mm -hmm. to actually the people that are buying from you. Because if people aren't buying whatever you're, the, again, like the widget that you're putting out there, whether it be a, an idea, whether it be uh, an actual thing that you hold in your hands or a service, if they're not actually signing and giving you money for that, that product, then there's no point in all the steps in between. Mm -hmm. So it all has to be this universal channel to that point. And if you as a, a, a business owner or someone that's actually trying to accomplish that, is that you are, you have to know your weaknesses and how, I don't know how to get here, so now I have to hire someone like Kirk to help me out and say, hey, this is, but there's that, that dialogue there. Yeah. You know, like with the podcast that, that we use that as an example, it's like we want to get this into more people's homes and in their cars and on their headphones and all that stuff so that at some point, if we hit it big, wouldn't it be cool if we could monetize this? Yeah. Absolutely. But until then, it's like at the same point, we want to have a consistent product so that once, once we get someone as a business, and this is just an example, we, we hire someone in a sense, we put you at that $35, $40 an hour mm -hmm. to be like, hey, we want to like improve this, what do we need? And you give us all your, your consultation and everything, this is what I, and I can help you out with that, and I, this is what my bill will be. And then it's a matter of what we can say, but it's still, you can't change that core product yeah. that has been succeeding, you want to tweak and build on top of it. And it's Damn. not, yeah. I mean, that's... I mean, it's absolutely I listen to me when I talk on the podcast. Oh, well, shut up. <laughs> no, I mean, that it's absolutely true. And it's... There are times where I don't believe in the product. But I believe in the guy. And I believe that he is genuinely interested in the product. Like, yeah. I said, Dan. Like, when I when I owned the gym, he came to me and was like, Hey, what do you think about this? And I'm like... So you owned a, a CrossFit gym, you said? Yep. Okay. Yep. So I owned a CrossFit gym. I was about probably almost a year into it. He came to me with the idea, and he's like, what do you think? I'm like, I think it'd be a great service. I don't know if I would buy the product, because I'm a busy gym owner. I don't want to necessarily, you know, maintenance my barbells. So it's Bar Shield USA is what it is. Okay. And Very cool. Yeah. No, it's great. And he is one of the most consistent people I've ever met. Like, he's just... And that's the other thing about finding balanced people. I'm a creative. He's just a really balanced guy. He just, Mr. Dependable. If there was one person I would label that, that would probably be him, right? And he came to me with that, and I'm like, I don't know. But, like, you're a good dude. I believe that you really believe in this product, and you're going to make it happen. And sure enough, it's growing. It's doing really well. I've done marketing for him. He's, like, taken, you know a little bit of what I said and then expounded upon it. He yeah. learned it. He like clearly wants to grow. It. And so that's a brand that I would not have bet in the product in the beginning, but now, you know, I'd eat my words and be like, yeah, this is doing really well. But to your point, you believe in, in, him, in him as a business yeah. person. So worst case scenario, he fails at that, but then he tweaks, it comes back firing again. And, 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 and that's when, He's, he's, I would hire him, and that's what I'm trying to do right now at the bakery company, and we've done some projects together, and that's the end goal is because he has that experience. He knows what it's like, and he's, again, another side of the coin of the way that I operate. Yeah. And that's how my other two business partners were with the gym. The other guy was, you know, previous military experience, very diligent, like, dude, you got you to gotta learn how to grind. Yeah. I didn't know how to grind. Really? I, yeah. Oh, you could, you could, if I looked at me, I was like a fluffy bunny. Like, <laughs> sounds I, really cute. Yeah. That's what it was. Like, oh, he's a nice guy. Like, yeah. if, if you would have met me back then, you would have been like, yeah, he's a nice guy. I would have been it. He means well. Yeah, exactly. That would have been me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, then he kind of, you know, roughed me up a little bit and, like, you know, put a little bit more character into me and instilled a little bit more, probably 
discipline and at the same time a little bit more of a harder edge. Yeah. And then my other business partner is great in sales. He would not take no for an answer and would get us great deals on products. He'd find sponsors. Surprise you almost, right? What on, I was at the time, I was the only one bidding for him to be, you know, part owner. And then sure enough, like, you know, a year in, I'm like, holy shit, this guy's totally worth it. Like, yeah. you know, totally worth bringing him on board. And that works as long as everybody's willing to work the relationship. Right. Right? I exactly. mean, marriage, a lot of that stuff, it's any relationship, as long as you're willing to work, you're, you still have something. But as right. soon as, and there's certain things, and why I end up leaving is like, there's just certain things, your morals, your principles, how you operate, whether it's personally or through the business, if you violate those, sometimes it's just, it's, it's a no-go. There's yeah. no going back from that, or if you're not willing to work past that, then that's just it. And there's something to be said for that, though. And I, and I got mad because I'm like, no, that, I can't believe that. Like, what? That's just not how he operates. Right. And he told me as much. Yeah. And so I walk away, and I'm like, I can't be mad at that. Right. I brought him into the business. We ran the business together. And then we just kind of finally, through time, narrowed on something that I didn't know in the beginning was going to be a hard no for him. There you go. And so I think that's what a lot of brands are afraid to really find is like, what are the no's? I feel like a lot of brands don't ever say no. Yeah. And to they don't. What? To what? Um, it can be anything. Okay. Just no to the point where. At the beginning. At the beginning, especially. Or as like you get, you know, bigger brands where I know companies that'll pay settlements just so a disgruntled employee doesn't go out and say anything bad about the company. Right. Because it's bad publicity. It's bad publicity. But it, if they were in the right the entire time, who cares? That's, you know, that's a classic thing now. Again, we go back to what we were talking about earlier with, you know, like we were talking about the whiskeys and if you went into a store and, you know, that's the death of some, some of these products where it's a, there's just nothing but negative reviews yeah. on it. You know, but if you're, if you're actually pushing forward and you believe in it and all that stuff, you will prevail, I think, a lot of times throughout all that. You know, if you, if you respond so aggressively to every negative Google exactly, review, yeah. every Yelp review, every Facebook comment that is against your business. Even though it is kind of funny sometimes. Well, yeah, I mean, you <laughs> read them, obviously. You have to read them because someone thought that. If, you, yeah. if, if they are off the wall and you know that you're doing well, in a sense, not, not being that stubborn owner, but like, you know, being that person where you're like, I've got all these people that are happy. This person, I remember that, and this is the actual circumstances. And then you look at their other Google reviews, or you look at their other Facebook reviews, and it, it, they're very opinionated, but a lot of them are negative. You're like, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. yeah. But because it's now it's a numbers game, and it's like, you know, it is that, that star rating and all that stuff, because there is some legitimacy to that. If you just get thrown under the bus, that might be the death of, of your product and your business. But mm -hmm. to your point is, is you've got to limit that liability, but at the same time, you have to stay true to yourself, and I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. But what do we always talk about when we talk about you know reviews and stuff with either the tenor box or the podcast or whatever? The people that are most mad are actually the ones that are going to be outraged and going to write something. Mm -hmm. Most most of the time, the people that are actually really happy with the product, they're not going to write anything because they feel like they don't need to because they're actually happy with the product. In my old in my old uh, business, it was you know we we sent out at one point it was mailers. We sent out mm -hmm. comic cards. You know, that was the, the old, I mean, everyone knows that. You know, if you, even if you put, you go and hand comment cards with, with postage paid, mm -hmm. or you get to the point where you're emailing them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so I go into Chipotle pretty much every day because they're our neighbors at Tinderbox East, and, and I got, uh, you know, Byron, he's, he's the, the, uh, the manager there, and he, it's like, hey, we get credit twice a month for the same email address. So at the beginning of the month, he's like, hey, bro, like, can you, you, you mind doing a survey? And at the end of every Chipotle receipt, there is chipotlefeedback.com, and you have a code on your receipt. Most people throw it away, or if some employees, you'll even notice that they just don't even hand the receipt. Do you need a receipt? No, they throw it away. Yeah, absolutely. So he's looking at me, he's like, hey, man, end of the month, this is the 29th, do you mind filling out another survey? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So I go next door, I eat my Chipotle, and I go on my phone as I'm eating, and I just plug it all in. I mean, but if they're not getting that, and you know what I mean, a lot of times it's the people that are, have negative experiences that outweigh the people that have positive experiences. And then people that have positive experiences with that, that business, they look at it and they're like, I'm shocked because I love going there. It's like, 
When was the last time you actually like put it out there that you had a positive experience out there? Yeah. Never. <laughs> Absolutely never. And so I, I don't have a Yelp account. And that's one of the things that like if a business would have come to me and be like, no, we got a lot of negative publicity. Let's like, what can we do about that? Okay, do you have any channels that are bringing in positive? No, you're not sending out comment cards. You're not sending out a survey automated after somebody's purchased it and had it for 30 days. You're not asking for positivity. You're allowing negativity. Right? And there's a classic example of it. I don't know if you ever used that, but it's like, hey, you know, like, can you do a, do a giveaway? Yeah. At the, at every month, you know, for, for filling out a comment card, we, we draw randomly and then you actually, through the service, you actually do that as the, when you send that comment card or you send that, that thank you email or whatever it might be on a lot of these things or if whatever, if it's the actual tangible product, you know, you put it in there with it and in that you say, we give away a $50 Visa gift card or we give away, it's something simple, you know, yeah. very, very minimal, but we give that away to a random comment card or comment review or whatever it might be every month. Simple things like that can actually boost the people that are positive about that's pretty cool. Like, I'll yeah. go ahead and, and do you that. have to make it easy for them. And so, Super easy. like, if you don't do it, you won't get it. Mm -hmm. That's like Dustin, you know, he just commented where he said, I get those responses all the time. Like, I'm, I'm assuming like negative responses. And it's like, you know, what he does is he actually pushes the, the surveys whenever he can. So, it's like yeah. we've been in those instances where he's actually kept the, the receipts and he's brought the receipts to the you know, the cigar shop and said, Hey, like, can you leave a good survey just cause, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's kind of one of those things where I know Dustin's a good dude. So yeah, I'm going to do on that service. You know what I mean? So, but they need to know that the, 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 the hierarchy needs to know that, be, you know, to, well, cause certain people aren't exposed to that. So if you're the one PR person and that's your job, your job is technically negativity. If your job description is branded handle all the bad stuff. Oh, I was a claims manager for a movie company for two and a half years. Exactly. You want to listen to that voicemail box? And my, so, <laughs> why'd you break my shit? Yeah. And then, okay, yeah. good example. My drywall will never be the same. Like, oh my god. <laughs> I, I, I will patch that. No, I want all new drywall. <laughs> the whole house. You break that. You broke that family picture. That's irreplaceable. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, all right, we're not gonna do that. I, can tell, <laughs> I, I know. I, can tell I know you've got that. I can tell how fucking moving story is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For another, like, until tomorrow. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cheers. Jesus. And so... <laughs> but I know what you're yeah. saying because I did that, and that was... And it's it's rough. really it's really that, and that's like a personal vendetta. It's a brand vendetta to, to ign not ignore, but downplay negativity and just push positive stuff. Um, I, from I, a branding I, side of it. From a branding yeah. side, yeah. Like, you got to handle it from a business side. Mm -hmm. You oh, have yeah. to absolutely well, every brush opportunity. it on the road. Yeah. Um, my mom actually works in a uh, accounts receivable, but it's it's like claims. Like you know, people move out. Say it's apartment complex, they'll move out. And there's always things you get charged for, or like maybe they miss rent, and so you know they go to her. Well, that's an opportunity to recoup money. Right. Yes, they're probably pissed off. Yeah. But at the same time, she's in a position to gain money that's already technically been lost. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's owed. But how much of that can you? Yeah, you're minimizing the loss at that point. And so at that point, you're like, hey, we, we realize things are hard. We can set up a payment, payment plan, what makes sense, and, you know, recoup that kind of stuff. And so that just goes into, you know, your standard operating procedures. How are you uniquely as a brand handling this position? Yeah. Are you labeling it completely different? When you have something negative, are you handling it or are you just not responding? Yeah. You know, from the claims position, when it was, it was not me in that position, you know, I was actually managing that side of it. It was one of those things. It's like, if you don't call them back and just tell them, oh, just way worse. Yeah. All you have to do is say, Hey, I'm still waiting for the vendor to come fix it. Or, you know, we're still working on it. Bear with us. We'll be in touch in 48 hours. That's all people want. Yeah. They want to know that their opinion matters when it's the, the negative, positive too, but negative more, more often is that they're, they're dealing with something and it's on, it's on their mind and they want to get out and tell everyone, never, never use this, this company again. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that you might run into or you have run into, but it's, I'm not doing that side of it and you want to focus on the positive so you're gaining new customers, but at the same time you have to address these issues. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Your brand has to be able to be, have that aspect of it where if they come back to you and it didn't go well, it's not saying you have to get, it's not a money back guarantee every time. Yeah. It can be something where it's like, you know, we're not going to give you your money back, 
but we're going to make you whole the best we can and also legally are obliged to maybe somewhere in the middle of it. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let's take a couple, a few steps back where, you know, we're, we're talking about Danny mm -hmm. and, you know, Barbell Shield or Bar Shield. Bar Shield. Bar yeah. Shield. And USA. And, you know, when he came out with that, so, so what it is, it is a, it, it's basically like bar maintenance. Yep. Cleaning supplies, everything, gym maintenance, stuff like that. It's like wipes. I remember, like, we, you know, I was going to old school and stuff like that, and Max Effort, that, you know, he was coming out with his wipes, and he, yeah. he did a really long trial. Oh, yeah. On basically, they, they were basically, they, it came out to be they were basically, you know, garage gear, you know, uh, uh, wipes. Yeah, like heavy much. duty wipes. Heavy duty wipes, you know, for the bars, wipe them off and everything, yeah. get the rust off everything else, and germs and everything. So this isn't like everyday, like, you know, like cleansing. No, it's, it's specifically marketed for gyms and CrossFit yeah. gyms. And, and what, you know, Kirk has done with, along with Danny and all of them, I really commemorate because it's, it, it's awesome because not only did Danny and, and you, Kirk, you know, I look at almost it, it sees the opportunity where we're in a massive era where fitness is a huge thing, right? And so yep. you guys not only stuck to something where you're passionate about it mm -hmm. with you with the marketing side, but but with Danny with doing having this vision of a you know of providing a, a service mm -hmm. right to someone and, and that's the big key is providing a service to someone that you think that's going to matter is yeah. this going to matter to someone right not you know not even thinking about the fact that this this is a, a giant era for fitness and you're about to start a brand that that a lot of people don't think about where you're you're not instead of spending four hundred dollars on a bar every year from Rogue or something mm -hmm. like that, he can actually come in with like, what, a $100 kit and make sure that that is good to go for 15, 20 years. Yeah, I mean, so and completely, it completely changes the dynamic. And that's the thing where, like you're talking, we're talking about branding, where it's like, not only do you do something that you love and that you think is valuable to others, but it's actually changing the entire realm of that of said that industry is, yeah. of that because industry it just wasn't thought of that way yeah right? and that's so, that, that's the key I think when you find that I mean you have hit a fucking nail on the head so if you look at any so this is like the subscription based model subscription based model would be anything that needs continual maintenance yeah. would you look at your car and say that you know oil changes are a subscription based model if you have to an extent have it, yeah what was the question like oil changes for your car yeah like it's not set up as a subscription based model but no. it, it's needed at the same time every time but we see the world going towards that though don't we yeah you do but phones barbell maintenance has never been looked at like that before and no. like you look at Airbnb like okay why I just have an unused room I could rent that well, you've helped Nettie out with that right well yeah I mean she clearly laid all the groundwork and you know I've done you know some videos and now she's doing her own podcast on that you know she has that expertise and you know is running with it and is clearly doing well and I just look at that and it's very hard as a brand to educate your audience at the same time so yeah. if you have a new product that doesn't make sense inherently and you have to educate them it's more expensive and it's going to take longer to make well, I think you, you actually hit on a, a, a big point there. So, like, you, you said earlier about this this, this bar, shield. Shield, bar shield. Mm -hmm. You didn't really believe Like, you didn't, like, get it. Like, you got it. But I got like, it. Like, I was like, like, it's yeah. hard to sell. It's hard yeah. to sell because most of these, you know, most of these gym owners, most of these people that are running these facilities, they just realize in their budget right now is, like, this is the lifespan of this equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, we can, we can clean it up. We can wipe it down or whatever it might be. But, like, overall... You know, that's part of the lifestyle is exactly. that you're going to have like, dirty hands. You, you, you should wash your hands before you leave the gym. Yeah. You know, because over, over time, like, you know, you don't want to have rust on there. But, you know, gym equipment fails. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, car, cars fail. Yeah. And it's not a new car. As soon as you start driving it, you need oil changes. You need all this preventative maintenance, preventative maintenance, the PMs and stuff like that. You can actually build in the service contracts. You can do all that stuff. 
and that might be the way that you translate it. Sometimes with, with brands and with products, it's, and that's where the brand image comes in. Mm -hmm. Not only the marketing side of it, but when you have an idea like that bar shield, that's where someone like you, Kirk, that comes into it and you're like, you start, your, your wheels are spinning. Mm -hmm. And you can relate it to something that people already relate to themselves as far as a, a concept that, yeah. that is something that you can say something like you just did. It's like, you know, like, like a car. Yeah. You know, it's like, do you want to just like let it, you know, you, you drive it to the wheels fall off? And I mean, God, my, my dad used to drive, um, you know, a 79 Lincoln Town car that I don't, I mean, I don't think he changed the oil for like probably like, like four years, five years at a time. You know what I mean? It was like 20 years old and all that stuff. And you're just like, I don't understand how this car is still running. Yeah. <laughs> so you finally change the oil and it's like, no, there's no leaks or anything like that. But it's like sludge, you know, like barely dripping out of the, you know, the yeah. bottom when I'm trying to change your oil. But everything seems to be working. I don't know why. I don't, this is mechanically not possible. Yeah. But, you know, Ford put out one car that actually made it without, you know, falling apart and you didn't have to do a shit to do it. Yeah. You know, I love that car. I drove it in high school. I love yeah. it. But, you know, it's one of those things where you actually do relate and that sometimes is that concept where you have an idea, the concept of yeah. this, this gym equipment cleaner and you can actually say, well, I see what you're doing here with the idea. Mm -hmm. But if you just walk into the gym and you're like, hey, do you want to buy my cleaners? They're going to be like, no, I don't. I'm good. Because yeah. they think a different way. But if you actually sell it in a, a pamphlet or you know a, a, a presentation where you're like, hey, this is how you know 10 years down the road, instead of replacing yeah. that bar, instead of replacing that, that rack, instead of doing this with whatever it might be, we can actually, this is your ROI mm -hmm. based on our projections. And if you put some sort of guarantee, not 100%, oh, yeah. but if you put some sort of guarantee, yeah. That you know you do this, we can guarantee that it will last. That if you stick with that, that is, you know warranties are the same way with cars. You were talking about, mm -hmm. you can keep a warranty. You're speaking my mind. Yeah, I don't want to get you started. I'm, no, I'm getting no. I'm, uh, my wheels are turning. But I'm saying like if you yeah, yeah the warranty is good, but at the same time if you don't come, bring it in for oil changes, you don't bring it in to get your tires rotated. Like those tires aren't aren't under warranty if you drive them for twenty thousand miles and never never rotate them. Yeah. Like we have to have documentation that you did that and if something fails, then yes, we got your back. Mm -hmm. But same thing with that at Bar Shield. It's like, yeah, we're gonna sell you this product, we're gonna, you know, send you all this stuff, but if you can't provide that you actually cleaned all this stuff, mm -hmm. then we can't really stand like just because it's sitting in your closet over here that we yeah. shipped you all this stuff, and you never used it, then you wasted money and now you know But especially at the beginning where you're doing that and you're like talking to brands and they like get they get your product. Like you have to have some way to showcase your product, right? Like mm -hmm. as like Steve was talking about like the reassurances and stuff. Imagine if, and I'm sure like Danny's thought about this. I'm sure you've thought about this, Kirk, where it's like, imagine if every, if you guys presented Rogue with a, a portfolio and said every bar you send out, you send out a, a bar shield box. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you imagine how big that contract would be? Oh yeah. Just, it would complete, I mean, that, that's all you guys would have to do. Yeah. To basically live on for the rest of your life. Yeah. As uh, how the fitness if industry you is that over. But that's yeah. what I'm saying is like, it, it's interesting, like, I think it's about capitalizing on the opportunity, not only in your passion, mm -hmm. but also understanding where the market is within that brand. If you mm -hmm. think, if you think there's a market out there for that, that's why, you know, you know, I got a lot, you, you knew Kirk where I was doing those whiskey Wednesday posts yeah. and I got that concept because I was, I followed a lot of people that had different, you know, they would show there's a there's a Instagram page out there that's called Whiskey Exchange okay. and I loved how they did things it's not every day but it's maybe once a week where they they put they, they do like a professional photo of a whiskey and they give like the, just everything that we've talked about everything that we talk about on every podcast <laughs> at the very beginning about our whiskey and that's I really really liked that because but I I wanted to put my spin on it, but somehow do that because that's where my passion lies, right? Mm -hmm. But then that's when I got into cigars. So I wanted that to be, that's where we wanted that to be added. We were friends, you know what I mean? And on top of that, <laughs> sure. <laughs> on top of that, no, okay. we're also in 
in the middle of a massive bourbon boom, yeah. where it's you cannot disclaim like what the bourbon industry is doing along all all lines, where yeah. it's in in the people that like don't drink and like appreciate you know the spirit of it. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter, but it is, it, it's a, it's a world encompassing thing that yeah. is at its height of all times. And I think we're in the middle of it. And that's the way I looked at it when we presented, like I presented, presented it to Steve where it's like, Hey, I'm getting all these you know, notifications and all these messages on like all these posts I'm doing every whiskey Wednesday, because I didn't want to do it every day. I wanted to do it once a week. I yeah. wanted to make it kind of a. A, an event mm-hmm. and, and have alliteration yeah and that's what we've done with the podcast at, as so yeah. where it's we've you know it's still on Whiskey Wednesday we try to do a different whiskey every week and but we're actually talking about it and actually bringing two different dynamics in it where we add cigars we add a pairing and we haven't really talked about the pairing tonight and we, we'll probably get to that but it's and then we also add in a life topic where we're talking about something that actually means something to everyone else. Well, you know? I, yeah, I think that's one of the things we actually worked on for a long time. You know? I fucking but, hated the idea at the very beginning because yeah, I didn't think that it. I didn't think that I can contribute to any because my thought was, is who the hell wants to listen to a twenty-three year old talk about life? Yeah, you know I mean, what I mean. Yeah, you get it. And that's it not is. a negative point. That's yeah. just fact. Yeah. But you know, that's where it comes down to it. Is you know, when you you have a, a product out there, and I, and, and I, I want to get your perspective on this, and this is a, a great example of it. Is when we were doing this podcast, and, and Jake and I were talking about it. You know, he's twenty three. I'm I'm thirty eight, and and I had done this whole previous over a decade in a career of of the, the movie industry. So it's a service related pro, uh, product, and and I was moving through the ranks. I did the. The, the fleet manager, the operations, the claims management, the sales and marketing manager, I was the general manager. I, I, so I saw all these aspects of, of these, this, this industry. Mm-hmm. And when we were coming out with this, it was kind of like, you know, like, let's do a, you know, Whiskey Wednesday. And when it comes down to it, you have this, that's where the, the conceptual side of it is, right? Yeah. You have the concept and you, you deal with businesses a lot of times, but where did it start? And I think when, when we're talking about brand images, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. And I learned that from, from Two Men in a Truck, it was, it was the it was two sons basically so it was brothers that started moving furniture when they were in their their summers right they went off to college their mom was was doing this other career right well she had if, if you anyone's seen the, the two men in a truck logo it's literally stick men in a truck yeah yeah she had it's that same thing it's not a cocktail napkin but it was like one of those things that was a little sketchy you can still see the the, the lines that she went over like there's three lines for the top of the cab you know what I mean it's like yeah. it's that basic. And it could be, I mean, I've, I've met the whole family. It could be that absolute bullshit story that they, yeah. they did. Like, let's conceptualize backwards. Mm-hmm. But no, they had, so the original two men were not the brothers necessarily. It was like their friends that did not go to college. They were still getting calls. And so all of a sudden it was like, then they sold the first franchise to the daughter who was in pharmaceutical sales down in Atlanta. And then all of a sudden they had this thing going and like the mom knew about the franchise. And all of a sudden this thing started blowing up and all that stuff. So you see this, this, this core idea, and that's what we kept talking about it. Where this, there's plenty of bourbon podcasts. There's there's yeah. plenty of cigar podcasts. There's plenty of, you know, all these things. And it's like when people are trying to do the brand image, like, and and correct me if I'm wrong or in your opinion, what sets you apart from all your competition? And that's where when we were sitting around the garage and we spent a lot of whiskey Wednesdays in this garage and elsewhere, but by the end of the night, whether you had two bourbons or you had, you know, you're, you're this far into a bottle with just a couple people or you have a handful of people and someone has a problem they're dealing with, you know, their, their job, their relationship, whatever, the fucking car broke down, whatever it might be, that's when the advice starts coming that's when the open conversation starts going and then that's when people start relating and that's the thing that we kept talking about and that's where I pushed for that part and Jake pushed for the other and then all of a sudden it melded together and, and now we're at that point where it's like you, I looked at your cigar and your ashtray. I don't know if you don't know how to relight it. or you I have like relit it a few times. Or but like, good. hey, I just get engaged. I'm very focused on I like what it. I do. I like that. And so, yeah. But yeah, to your point is... Um, but that's the, like, yeah, it's, the, it's the, the concept. So it's like that's, you have to have an actual product. Yeah. And it, I, I believe you have to have a why. 
do I believe the why has to be the exact same throughout the entire business or entire, it, no, it changes. Mm -hmm. You educate yourself, things change, right? Awesome, right? And, but it always has to be true. It always has to be genuine. And as soon as you start getting into it for like the wrong reasons and yes. doing things that just, you can still be in it for the right reason, but not do what you need um, to keep your customers. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I would love to say, Kirk, you have so much great experience. Your design is amazing. You're just so talented. At the end of the day, why people hire me is because I'll talk to them. Yeah. I return their emails and I do what I say I'm going to do. I, that, I was going to say that. Like, I that's love that last point. That's it. It's so important. They're like at the end of the day, because of my industry and all the negative connotation around web developers, oh, I've had that web developer it just, you know, held my website hostage and I, that's like the worst, right? Like you never, I've run into brands where I have to call the web developer and be like, listen here, fucker. Okay. Like very, I know what you're doing. It's very egotistical. It is because uh, they're creatives. They feel like they have this massive yeah. skill that's yeah. worth $150 an hour. And guess yeah. what? <laughs> if you can't, and this is my other big thing. If you can't set the expectations, you can never meet the expectations or exceed them. So you have that as your goal. So you have to have that. Right. You're setting yourself up at $150 an hour. I don't know anybody that's going to really meet that. Like, but it's all relative, relative right? I mean, it like, is. So and it's relative to different people. How well you There's no it. frame of reference, though. That, you there know, isn't. If you approach, well, I mean. There can be. I mean, if, if, if Kirk comes in also and they're like, hey, I got this other guy coming in next, you know, so if you're actually shopping around and get two, three estimates, you know what I mean? You talk to one person and they're like, yeah, I can do this, this, and this. And, you know, they have a portfolio and they say, yeah, I'm 150 bucks an hour. This is what I, I suggest and everything like that. And then Kirk walks in and he's like, yeah, I'm 35 bucks an hour. Yeah. Well, that's the same thing I ran into with like Max Effort and Corbin. I want to say something about that. As you go forward, if you are bidding against people that you already know your competition, it sounds like they're 150 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. Like you, there, there's a point. Are you asking business. me will I jump? Like, well, no, I'm not asking you. I'm saying I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna state this is that I think there's a point, and we talked about with bourbons, we talked about with cigars. If you are significantly less, mm -hmm. and you come in as competition, mm -hmm. it can be perceived as a negative. Oh yeah. Because if someone like if again, someone has no frame of reference, they have a startup business or they're like a few years into it, and all of a sudden they're like, take I got three bits. One's at one fifty an hour, one's at one twenty an hour, and then this guy over here. He seems he doesn't know what the hell he's he doing. He seems great. He's got a cool portfolio. He seems like yeah. you know what he's talking. like it's actually the same conversation he he threw out thirty five dollars an hour. Uh, let's take the middle guy. He yeah. got hundred and twenty dollars an hour. So it's almost like you have to, like you, and I'll say this from a, from a branding and a marketing standpoint, I agree with everything you're saying and I think that's great, but the more you know of what your competition is doing, and this is not just directed at you, but anyone that's talking about brand image and, and, and when you get to that pricing side of it, mm -hmm. you have to do like mystery shopping. Oh, you yeah. have to have someone that's giving you feedback somehow, whatever industry you're in, you yourself, if you already know people are charging 150, 120, you don't necessarily, like you're like, I thought it was reasonable at 35, but I guess I'll go to 60? Yeah. Or 75? True. And if I go 75, I'm still going to be the lowest bid? It's crazy. But it might be justified based on my work and my, my referrals and my portfolio and everything else that they're going to be like, that we're going to use this guy. He, he's ripping himself off. Yeah. And then at that point, obviously, as your business structure changes, if you have to hire people in, Obviously, your costs are going to go up. Yeah. Because now you have to supply more people. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's one of those things you have to be. I think when you're talking about brand image, and I think this is a great concept to introduce at this point, is that you have to be uh, very aware of your competition for what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. you, the biggest thing is when I hear thirty five bucks an hour, I think it's like you're reinventing the wheel. Yeah. And you're doing something that when you look at people that are around you and. You, you don't want to talk bad when you go into a, a potential client and say, yeah. you know, hey, I know people are going to charge you well over hundred dollars an hour. My my rate is thirty five. <coughs> you might look at it as like, you know, I'm, I'm selling myself. Yeah. Sometimes people will look at that and be like, yeah, he he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about because he is so cheap. Yeah. No, and it might almost like devalue you. No, it totally does. I've had a couple instances where I've had to prove. Why $35 is even good, 
like, how can you make money at thirty-five dollars an hour as a web designer? Like, right. does that make sense as yeah. a business? Like, yeah, I no. feel bad for you. Yeah, that's what not me. Sense. I'm saying like, well, people, yeah. Yeah. people will be like, Kurt, no, like. Can I I'll pay, pay you more. more. Yeah. I, yeah, um, I want to so, hire you, but we want to hire you with this. You're like, no, no, no. And you have to take like this frame of reference from like where I've come. And this is where I, <coughs> we used to live off my wife's salary when I owned the gym. Made yeah. no money for two and a half years. Uh, so we got used to cooking at home, having wine once every two weeks. What, I just, what we talked about earlier in the podcast. And not like, going out. out. Yeah. Being fit. And finding a way to be happy and do that. So all of a sudden now, Kirk's making maybe a couple thousand dollars a month. Holy shit balls. I've never seen this much money in my life. <laughs> steak, <laughs> steak dinners every night. And so let's hire let's hire a maid. And that's where, you know, <laughs> of being so poor and never wanting to go back into debt and never having to I don't I literally told my wife, I go, I never want to buy another piece of equipment on credit ever again. That's nice, yeah. And I up until that point, I always had to. It's like, you know, the camera equipment, you're looking at a lens, $1,500 average. You're yeah. At the camera, yeah. a couple thousand dollars. Like, yeah. my industry is not cheap. Mm. Shit that you got, I know it ain't Yeah. Cheap. And I'd be proud to say this that I just bought a new MacBook Pro in cash for my business. Wow. They're and, slick, aren't they? Yeah. Like, and I've had one previously. I had that. And I just got to the point where it made sense. I had eight gigabytes of RAM, was running. I literally had to tap the space bar every single time just to play my video yeah before i even edit it if i had special effects on there it'd be like every five seconds pause wait for it to load do it again yeah jake was telling me about like you know like we should edit the youtube videos that i'm uploading and i tried that once and i've got a macbook air from two, mid 2011 so what we do you know when i do like the social media and stuff like that you know and I, we're doing the podcast it crashed that one time but ever since then it has been a problem yeah. but as soon as i went into like even just iMovie to try to edit a video yeah I fucking turned it off. I was like, fuck it. No, 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 no. You should really talk to Eric because that's what Eric helped me with. Like, yeah. I, had a, I had a MacBook Pro from like 2012. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he boosted my, you know, RAM up to 16 gigabytes. Yeah. And, and the then, older models, you could do that. You could yeah. add it to it. And I've, I've gotten big into that. I've had a desktop where you can have all this. And I, I've chosen I'm not going to do Microsoft. I'm not going to do Windows. I need this because I'm portable. That's what I do. I'm on site. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm an Apple guy. And I like it. And there's a lot of things that I the like about it. The portability. But, but I know yeah, I like upgraded to 16 gigabytes. It cost me almost two grand. Like, that's a big investment for a small business. Yeah. And that going back to, like, practicality doesn't make sense. I didn't want to spend that money. I had it. But I'm yeah. like, this is going to, you know, kind of staunch my cash flow cash flow for the next couple months. Yeah. You know? And I tell businesses that all the time. I'm like, cash flow will kill your business before a bad idea ever will. That's right. And they're like, well, how does this make sense? I'm like, we could market $300 per month for the next three months. Mm -hmm. And then we will have no ad budget. Mm -hmm. That'll be the end of it. So our runway is three months. Do you want to do three months? Or do you want to give us six months? you want to give us a this year? Just talk to a client? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I talk to clients for advertising. I'm like, can you spend $5 a day? More often than not, the first time I talk to them, no. I want them to spend $5 a day just on social media. And they say no. And they're like, I can't afford it. It's $150 a month. There's a lot of small businesses that are like that. They're yeah. cash flow cheap. They have nothing. It's interesting, though, because you have to get them to buy into it. You know, it's one of those things where... It's justifying it. Mm -hmm. One of the, the great examples is when you look at a business, they can justify, you know, on the company dime, you know, buying breakfast on, on oh, yeah. Friday. Sure. You know, doing this type of thing. But I think it's, it's perks, right? And then you look at the budget and you're like, so five bucks a day, think about, what. look at your P&L. And that's a tough thing to walk into another business and actually exactly to, you're, you're confronted and you're like, hey, see. Let me see it. <laughs> yeah. I, don't I don't want to necessarily look at your profit and loss, but at the same time, I'm asking you to look at your profit and loss, and if you can actually give give me five dollars a day for this, for the potential return on investment, give me six to twelve months, and 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 have a sacrifice. If you can cut five dollars a day out of your business, five dollars a day, and you can relate it to people's personal expenses. Go to Starbucks. Yeah. Or go to like, you know, a restaurant like I'm talking about Easton here in Columbus, Ohio. It's like you look at the line outside of like North Star Cafe for brunch. Yeah. 
people wait an hour for brunch. Yeah. And it's like, you go to Starbucks and you walk in sometimes for a fucking $6 coffee. And, yeah. it's, and it's a half hour wait to, to stand in line while people are like sitting around on their laptops and doing all that shit. It's like, no, $5 a day for what you're asking for is absolutely, in this day and age, worth it. Oh, absolutely. But, but it's actually getting your, like, we're diving back into you selling your brand. Yeah. Which I like. I like how this, this conversation is going back and forth. Like, you're, you're talking about brand image and everything for everyone else. But when it comes down to it, you have to deal with it every day. Yeah, and it's, what, this is why it's so hard. And this is where I don't think people, agencies. So, going back to, like, kind of what I said before, here's me. Here's what an agency charges. There's a massive gap in between there. Like you just said, there's 150 and I charge $35 an hour. And there's this massive gap. I'll eventually get there. I'll eventually. But right now it doesn't make sense. I'm making a good living. I can reinvest in my company and I can pay my bills. There's no reason that I can't in that time take all that experience, build up more wealth to be worth $50. Are you getting, are you getting told no though because of that? Never. So that's good. I, I, no, I thought yeah. you might be. I thought you might be because so, you know, and you're doing what you love. Exactly. I'm, so yeah, I would I get, get no that. if I bid for projects. No, but I'm saying like it's it's one of those things, and, and, and businesses like you said, and, and I'm going off what you said, Kurt, yeah. is that you, you you have to to if you stay true to what you said in the beginning, you don't evolve, you don't grow, and you don't like to adapt and all that mm-hmm. stuff. You're gonna you're gonna sell yourself short. So that's where you look at it, and it's like. You know, the common business practice is like, well, the way we fix everything is we just raise prices $5. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's common. But if you're already at the top of scale and you, you have that mentality, then you, you're going to screw yourself eventually. You know what I mean? Because now you're just widening that market. When you're at the bottom and you, you, you have that, and, and this is not just for your business, but I think when people are starting up, I think there is a, a humbling side of it where you're like, like, I like the way you framed it where, you know, how much is a comfortable living what is an hourly rate? And you were asking us to qualify that and based on like not knowing your industry mm-hmm. and what consulting firms actually charge. But when you when you look at it and when it's, again, when you learn what other companies are charging, you're like, all right. And that's where it comes back to, to you and your family and your lifestyle where it's like, I'm not gonna get greedy, but it's like, all right, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flirt with this. I'm gonna, ne- next client I have, and instead of being 35 an hour, our, uh, my new rates are 40. Yeah. And now you go into this company and it's like, what is that? When do you, when it's just you and you don't have employees and all the, the overhead, but it's like, you might want to, not you, but like mm-hmm. there are people out there that are doing this brand imaging and they're doing the marketing side of it. And, and when it comes down to sales, again, I think sales is the, the end all be all. Yep. You can 100%. have a great brand, you can have a great marketing strategy, but if you're not making sales, you're fucked. You're gonna go. You're gonna have. An, you're gonna be working in a cubicle next week because you were a business owner and you just basically priced yourself out, right. or you basically had a great concept. You said you've had clients that had great concepts, but it's like you have no synergy on where you're gonna go from from here to here. So it's like, do, is that a strategy to you? Where like for you and your business, would you say, all right, so next week I've got a new client. Not gonna get crazy. Not gonna double our rate. But I'm going to try to present them with forty dollars an hour. Yeah. So thirty seven dollars. Thirty six yeah. thirty five fifty an hour. Like, you know, like where's the increments where you actually say, Hey, I, I know I've proven myself mm-hmm. and I'm not gonna be the small, small guy. I'm still gonna be the, the smaller guy and the humble guy that comes in, I'm gonna give you my honest because nothing's changed in your character, but at the same time you're running a business and you say all right, so now I've got to actually say, I'm still going to be the cheapest, but I, I'm going to need a new laptop. I'm going to need a new camera. I'm yeah. going, you know. I have this much overhead. Well, yeah. like, fuck, like, I don't know if you have kids. Do you have kids? Not yet. So, I, I got a baby on the way. Like, yeah. All right, yeah. So, so do you wait for your baby to be on the way, and all of a sudden you're like, all right, now I'm 50 bucks an hour because I'm looking at finances. <laughs> yeah. God damn. But if you creep yourself up there in the meantime with your, your five-year plan, now yeah. all of a sudden it's like, all right, so now I'm 35, and then six, 12 months later, like now I'm, I'm, I'm 40, and then now I'm $50 an hour, and like you see it. Now all of a sudden you get, you get told no on a job because you're like, well, I got someone that's $150, $110 an hour, you're you're a hundred dollars an hour. You've you've creeped up that far. I'm gonna go with this person. You're like, all right. So then that and, and with your business, it's it's not something that necessarily is like a 
day in, day out churning, like all these people are calling me, so I'll like, they're gonna start talking and be like, well, they're giving me different prices. You are actually dialing in yeah. on, on what your niche is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And right now, um, to your point, yeah, like right now, $35, it makes sense for me. It makes sense for my clients, it makes sense for the expectations and the skill level that I think I have. But that being said, it's like going back to the Gary Vee thing. I've you know I've had I've listened to him forever, but it's like a fi- like fifty one forty nine. I'm giving them fifty one percent of the value, I'm getting forty nine. I'm okay with that. Like I'm living a good comfortable life. I'm running a business. I'm making money. It's growing at forty nine percent. In that fifty one is the recommendation that I need. I need all of my clients in the very beginning to be like, Kirk worked with us through shit. He was there, like, I work with a, a renovation couple, and I'm there, you know, till wee hours of the night, Yeah. just staying up waiting for the project to get done. So we All can, billable hours? Or no, yeah. just because in the beginning, you, you make the mistakes, you make the commitments, but you believe in the brand. Yeah. So you're gonna work for nothing. You're yeah. gonna work for pennies on the dollar. Yeah. And I've done that and I still do that because I feel like my philosophy now is every, if I'm getting like payable clients, those pay the bills, right? The free work is what grows my business. Like, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. Like I'm stepping outside of what That's I do. Point. And so, you know, 80% of what I market to clients, I tell people like, we're going to, we're going to market your services and products. 80% of those are your bread and butter. Yeah. The 20% is what you want to do in the future. Yeah. Right? If I want to get into podcast editing, I'm going to gradually dabble a little marketing in there. Great. Just a little bit. Start growing it. But I'm not going to be like, this is what we're doing now. 80% of my marketing budget is all podcasting. Not good. So I'm very patient in it and like the marathon look. Like I'm in it forever. So would you say you're constantly learning? Oh, every day. Yeah. Like one of the things I I would talk back and forth with Dan with because we'll meet on like a weekly basis is I'll I'll every time I do a new video I'll put a new technique in there that I haven't used before. Really? Oh yeah. Like I mean, there's so much to learn. There's no reason why you couldn't, mm. except for the fact that you wouldn't didn't want to. Yeah. Or you, you didn't too, feel it. Or you didn't feel it, or you were, maybe you're just too scared to try it and put it in you know a video that's for a client. That was my thing with like video editing. Like I I when I shot things Mm -hmm. and shot the imagery of it, I would almost see where I wanted it to be, but then I would review the footage and I would almost come up with an entirely different feeling sometimes Yeah. and then say, okay, so how do I do this? Well, I got to learn how to do that. Exactly. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? And I know that happens with you all the time. Like, you know, like I was honestly just a, on a personal note, like I, I was like, honestly, like really jealous of like the, what you did for Corey Gregory with his, you know, intro video. Yeah. And, and you absolutely killed it with all of the, the different um, dimensions and all the different, uh, I would say almost uh, like static yeah. movements and, and uh, you know, imagery with that. I mean, that was awesome. So that's, that, it's an overall learning yeah. process. And each project's different. And that's what I like. I hate doing the same thing every day. It will literally kill me. There, I had an argument with my wife <coughs> probably four years ago now where she's like, why can't you just take a regular job? <laughs> why can't, like, why can't you? She knew that when she married. And she did. But, like, it just kind of got to the point where, like, finances were tight, yeah. tensions mm-hmm. were high, and I, you know, I was getting very stressed out, and I'm like, I just can't, babe. Like, I will literally suffocate, and I will die there. Because there's no more room for growth. I would, I would, I would jump to it. This is I was trying to go back to school. I'd go to school full time. I'd work full time. What would happen was I'd be at that job, and I would just keep moving up. I would move up as fast as I can. Yeah. And at 20 years old, I was managing a team of 20 to 30 people at Target, working from 4:30 in the morning till about 1 p.m. Six days a week. Keys to the store. Codes to the store. 20 years old. Not even 21. Making like, good money for making really tw- yeah oh yeah I can pay all of my bills with a quarter of one of my yeah. checks yeah, yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. like I'm living the dream right yeah. and then you top out and you're like 
There's no more. This you hit the ceiling. You got to go back and get a degree. I don't want to do that, right? And so I would just do that with every job, and she would just get so mad that I would go to the top, go to another job, work to the top, go to another job. Yeah. And all all the while I was you know trying to make my own businesses work, and that was in the end what I ultimately wanted to do. So it was just really hard for her, and at the end of the day, I just kept having to say like no like this is and I didn't have kids so like if I had kids obviously I'd be like fuck I'm working third shift like, yeah you can work, work for different reasons you know so, I mean the paycheck goes different ways different responsibilities and, you know I was fortunate that my wife literally gave me the opportunity for two and a half years to run the gym and I didn't have to be financially responsible I contributed nothing to that relationship Financially. Financially. All right, let's, let's get Well, I would... No, it's actually... <laughs> I don't know that really shit, man. Where, where are you going? No, it's actually... That's actually a very good point. I mean, I was, a, I was a terrible husband. Really? Because I would work 80 hours. Damn. I would get home. There. I would I'm sleep. not going anywhere. Yeah. I just saw where you You started going. it. Well, I, I was mean, trying to throw like, I would, throw like I a would, podcast. I would, well, I would just I'm come home and I would, I would just sleep. I was so tired. Yeah. And then I'd go back, wake back up, do it. There was no growth. So therefore, I started to just like hunker down. I'm like, You're eating away yourself. Yeah, I'm like, there's no yeah. change. We went to Italy, and just we couldn't afford it at the time. And she's like, we gotta go for 10 days. Go for 10 days, I come back. But wait, wait, wait. No, so I'm at the gym, she tells me we just gotta go. We haven't taken a vacation. We before. have to go to Italy? I have to go to Italy. I was like, okay. I like it. She just calls me at I work. Like I like it too, but I was like, I'm listen. She's at work. I'm sleeping. I'm in the middle of my eighty hour week. I'm tired. She calls me. And she's like, we need to book these tickets. They're you know great price. Let's go. And I was so tired. I didn't care. I was like, okay, we booked them. <laughs> and then, the old fuck it thing. Yeah, that's that's what happened. <laughs> went, to, went to Italy. Spent ten days there. Learned a little. Got a little bit of perspective. Got a little bit more patient, kind of opened my eyes up. Like, well, you got out of that element. You exactly. Got, you got, you, it's, it's that that point. Like when people don't take vacations and things like. Talk that. about the hands, Steve. Yep. I'm not doing the hands. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard that on the podcast yet? What? Do you know so, that? Yeah. Go talk, ahead. Talk about you the hands. No, no. I want to hear you explain. So we always talk about the hand in the face, where it's like if if your hands in your face, you can't see beyond your hand. Yeah. And if it, if you broaden it out, then you're able to see the whole picture. Oh yeah, absolutely. So that's what happened. And so on, within welcome, yeah. three months of me coming back, yeah, <laughs> within three months of me coming back from that vacation, I left the gym. And so that was like, it was a super rough time. I mean, to the point where I, where I left the gym and it was just kind of an abrupt ending. There was probably a month where I would sleep 12 hours every single night. Like, didn't wow. matter. I was physically, mentally, emotionally drained. And then a month later, I'm like, Towards the end of that month, I'm like, there's a problem. Like, I can't wake myself up. I can't. I was, I was just doing basic stuff. And why I said I was a terrible husband is at the end of that month. You were. Exactly. I mean, well, based I was, on what you said, I can tell you why you were a terrible husband. is because you were working all the time. Exactly. And you, you thought you were doing the right thing. But at the same time, you just said it. There's no relationship time. You literally were working. You say goodbye in the morning. And, and I was day. frustrated with her. I was short. You know, I'd be like, baby, you don't get it. I'm building her business. You don't get it. I'm building her business. Like, that was it. That frustration, I think, was actually projected probably. Most likely. Because, then again, when you got home, it's that classic thing. It's, honestly, I'll say this. It, it, typically, it's a classic thing when you get home and and one side of the relationship is, is somewhat good in, in a sense. You know what I mean? They're, they're living their everyday life. And the other person is struggling. They're trying, mm -hmm. but they're in that that depression mode. Yeah. And uh, what was that movie? Um, had Jason Bateman in it. And when you think about it, it's not always about sex or anything like that. But it's I think it was um, Extract. I think it was. Oh, okay. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he came home and it was all that that sweatpants thing. You remember that? Did yeah. anyone see that movie? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where it's like you know all of a sudden it's like he tries to rush home, but by the time he gets home, you know it's like his wife was like put on sweatpants and it's like cinch the ties yeah, on like the sweatpants done. and he's just like ah oh, no, I missed it so like that was you uh, you know as a terrible husband at the yeah. time where it was like all you did was you worked you woke up you went to work you came home I want to sleep and then it's like I might get food or all that stuff but at the yeah. same time he's like how was your day I just want to sleep yeah. and there's no there's no relationship there and that wasn't even the worst part the worst part was 
that month goes by yeah. and then all of a sudden one day I wake up and I'm waking back up at 4 or 5 a.m. on my own, no alarm. And then I start doing just random stuff. I like fix stuff that was wrong with her car. I just needed to be taken in, but I didn't have time to do it before. She just came home one day. I was cooking. I like cooking. I just didn't have time to cook. And so all of a sudden she came home and she just said like, I think the words were, it's nice to have you back. And that was it. And I'm like, I feel like shit. That is a uh, equalizer there. Yeah, I, I'd like to add in on something that, with that because it. it I don't know where the conversation goes. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm yeah. starting to like throwing out relationships. What happens? This, this is Whiskey Wednesday. Yeah. I know you haven't drank a whole lot, you haven't smoked yeah. a lot, but this is where it goes. What I, What I love listening to this is because I, I I feel like this is why I really wanted to pitch Steve like to have you on here is because mm-hmm. I know. Because we don't hang out a lot, no. you know, to to you know the the broads I do, but I feel like we're on the same wavelength where it's like, it's one of those things where, you know, the listeners have heard my my past in the last like four months. Mm. So, when you say what you just said, where, you you talk about the fact that you put all your energy and all your effort into something and then you just move on to something else, right? Mm-hmm. And then you find something that you actually have passion or passion about and passion for mm-hmm. and you put all your energy into that and then it ends. Right? Oh yeah. And it completely, and this, this isn't a negative point, like this is fact where it, for I think people like us that, that want to accomplish something and then move on to accomplish something bigger. Mm-hmm. Or greater, right? Yeah. Where you it completely devastates you, and and you you, uh, you there's a there's a part of you where you can't wake yourself up in the morning. And there's no you you lose a drive aspect to yourself, and I think a lot of people don't know, and I don't even know, and I've had to cope with that, where when when you know you're trying to build something great. And you have just left something that you know that was toxic. Mm-hmm. Toxic is a good word. Yeah, you have yeah. you have to allow. It's hard your, to leave. You have to allow yourself to build on yourself, and you have to allow yourself to cope with that. And, and but the but the hardest part is is when you're when I know you're very self realization, and mm-hmm. you can you can pick things out in yourself. And I'm the same way. Where it's like when you feel something's off and that said thing happens and you feel off for a while and you're like, what the fuck's wrong with me? Mm-hmm. And then it just starts, it cas- it cascades into just a revolving door. And you cycle down. And, yeah. then, and then you feel like you just can't go anywhere. It's like quicksand. Mm-hmm. But then what I loved hearing about like what you just said is where you started realizing where you started waking up on your own. You started, and it just sort of happened and you allowed yourself... You allowed, I'd like to say you allowed like the, out of your, you allowed the, your faith in, in, in what you couldn't control, you allowed it to happen. Yeah. And you allowed yourself to become what you are today. And I, I think like I'm in the middle of that. And I think for most of our viewers that want to try to do something yeah. that is outside of their range, but they have passion for and that they don't want. They don't want to, they either have family or they have, a, you know, they have people that depend on them and, and they can't, they, they, they can't even think about going away from that and taking that risk. For those people that, that don't think that they can do that, they, they can, but, but just know that there's going to be that hard point in your life where, or in that time where you're going to second guess yourself every day. Yeah. But you have to realize it's part of the process like people in the fitness industry always always want to talk about the process and how it's trust the process yeah Yeah. where it's where it's strenuous on your body and you have to like lose weight and you know have to sacrifice your meals and what you want to eat and what you should eat yeah it's the same way with business and fucking life where you need to understand that the process is and I need to understand that myself where I need to understand the process is that this is a part of my young life and it's only building me better the problem is, is it's not as fast as where I'm wanting it to go. Oh yeah. But the patience is the key to my success. Yeah. And then it does happen, and then it fucking blows up. And Look where you are now. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, 
I, if you're listening to this podcast, everything that I say may sound like extremely successful. Like maybe it doesn't, maybe it just sounds mediocre to you. But I, I spout all of this, but then like you really don't get to see anything that goes on, right? Like you don't know the day, yeah, day, you don't know yeah, the day, day, day yeah. out. Please do not let me act like my life is hard. My life is not hard. I get to run my own business. I work with really cool people who are just great people in general. Yeah. They have good businesses. I work for myself. I get to wake up every morning, walk my dog in the morning, have coffee. I see my wife off to work. Get on cool podcasts. Get on badass podcasts like yeah. this. Yeah. Right? So, Not so, this one, but like other ones. <laughs> no, this, <laughs> this, this, yeah, this one. This oh, one right this, now. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, meant, uh, so, I misspoke there. <laughs> and so when I say that, I mean, the, the classic saying is, you know, I'll work 80 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week for somebody else. Right? Yeah. I would take that exchange. I would take that risk. I would take that jump. That's just me. That's just how I am. Um, but there's a self-realization there because at the same point, like you did that before yeah. and you're fucking miserable. Oh yeah, absolutely. So you're working 80 hours a week for yourself. I know you had business partners, but you were doing it, but you obviously were misguided at that point. Like you, you lost your, your purpose. You lost your, your drive. Like your drive was for, for, for the, for the, like you were trusting the process in a sense, but you were, it sounds like you were actually just driving forward to drive forward. This exactly. is what I'm supposed to do. Well, yeah, and I'm already good. in it and I'm, I'm miserable, but this is what I'm, uh, it'll, it'll, so I, I gotta, I gotta intervene here a little Let bit. Let it roll. Let oh, it roll, like man. For, for you, Jake, it's like, you know, when you're talking about that, when you're saying like, you know, at, at some point it'll hit. At mm -hmm. some point it'll hit. Like, I gotta, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. But I think that Kirk is a great example that at some point, you do have to walk away from that toxic relationship. And business is, is one of those things. So it's like, I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep, we, we had that last, last episode was actually about always growing and always grinding. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. But at some point there is a self-sacrifice that if you're always just grinding, grinding, grinding with no results that you want to have, there is that thing, just like in any relationship, any venture that you do, anything that you, you invest your time and your life in as a finite resource that you will actually be like, is, is this it? Like, I mean, when, when is it going to come? You can't be impatient to, to your point. You gotta, you gotta be patient. Jake, you said that, but to your point, like you did that, you did that. And then things that actually matter to you truly matter to you, like your wife mm -hmm. and maybe sometimes potential future family that you actually are looking at it. And you're like, this isn't it. Mm -hmm. And what it took was, is just getting out of it for just for a week. Yeah. Seven to ten days, you got out of it, and you're like, you had this time for a like, I'm still thinking about the business, I'm still thinking about this, I'm doing all that stuff, but then you have these new experiences. So now all of a sudden you're not so ingrained in just the the cycle that you're in. Wake yeah. up, go to work, I'm be, I'm I'm up before my wife, I, I come home, she's already in bed, now I'm doing this. Now all of a sudden it's like you do that for two years, you said, or whatever it was. Yeah. And she says, Hey, we're going to Italy. I almost laughed at that at one yeah. point because you're already saying like we're kind of strapped a little bit financially, but it's just the two of us. We got we can we can do it. It's gonna be more tight, yeah, or beyond tight, yeah. Now we're actually digging ourselves out of that, but let's do it. And you come back from that type of thing, and that's a that that almost like self reflection moment that you don't get forced upon yourself because you have someone that cares about you. But what yeah. happens if so you get out of the toxic situation mm -hmm. and in business? And and then or anything. Should, or anything, but you but you still feel that some sort of that uh, rationale of well this I, I don't know where my drive went. You no, know, I, no I, I that's that. that's what I was saying. No, that's what I like. I, I'm not negating what you're saying. That's what I like about having Kirk on here is because now now you're in this business that you're still grinding like we talked about last week. You actually are doing what you were doing. But now you have this this new purpose, this new goal. You're working for yourself. You're doing all that stuff, and and I'm I'm interested to actually talk to you within the next six months or next year, you know, the next twelve months, and see. You know, I'm not saying this because it's very easy service level. Like, what are you charging your clients? What, yeah. what like how many employees do you have? What what growth do you have? Because there's nothing wrong with actually staying where you're at and doing what you're doing. Because you keep saying you have a comfortable living and all that stuff. Yeah, it's not trying to to get to that point where you're actually. You're, you're growing just to grow. Yeah. You grow because you want to grow. Exactly. If you're yeah. happy with where you're at and you're handling yourself, you don't want to bring on employees. You don't want to do that from a business standpoint. You want to add more complications to it. 
you, you're, you're fine with what you're doing, but then now it's just like your normal stuff, like cost of living is going up a little bit. So now, you know, I keep going back like 35 bucks an hour is, is different because now like cost of living in the last five years is 3%, 3%, 3%, whatever it is, you know yeah. what I mean? Now it's like, now I'm actually making less money relatively to what is going on around me and my, my demographic, my, 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 my circle of, of, of uh, proximity. So that's where it's like, you have to do that. Mm-hmm. Or do you want to grow? I mean, that's again, that's that brand image where you want to do this, where he's now found this thing where he's taking the same mentality of what you were doing at the gym, where you were just, just in a sense, doing what you love, but then it turned into killing yourself because you were killing your relationship. You were killing, like you said, you were, you said you were a terrible husband. Oh yeah, absolutely. So that's not what you want to be. Yeah. That, that, that actually now all, it, it compounds on top of that. Like all of a sudden you said quicksand. I love that example because now all of a sudden you're doing, you feel like, it's me. I've used it before. I'm giving you credit on that tonight where it's like, you know, it's honestly, it, it is the quicksand. No, it absolutely is that. That's a great use of that where you can't get out of that because now all of a sudden you think you're doing the right thing, but everything else around you is failing. So it's like you're, you're giving your, your daily hours to something that you feel and at one point was succeeding, but now it's just sucking life out of you. And then all of a sudden you look around you and you're like, well now my wife's not happy. Now all of a sudden my family's not happy. Now my friends aren't happy. I can't see, like everything's miserable. Now all of a sudden you get out of it and now you've applied all, of, all the things you've learned from that to this new business. And you're able to do what you love and you're able to, to manage that. You've learned a lot from your failures and even some of your successes that may be uh, portrayed as failures. Yeah. No, absolutely. But you've actually taken all that and now it's a chance to take all that and actually grow forward. Move forward. I think that was your closing remarks, man. That was killer. No, that's good. I mean, yeah, that's it. I mean, that's... You're trying to shut me up. No. <laughs> oh, that's, I mean, that, that's absolutely it. It's, it's how much... Everybody's different. You, I don't think early on in life, you know, you graduate from high school and you go to college. How much do you invest in yourself? You're changing so much, it doesn't really make sense to invest in yourself because your your body's changing, your mind's changing, the world's changing around you. And you get to this point at whatever age it is, like he said, like there's a realization that happens. And yeah. whenever that realization happens is whenever those transitions take place, whether it's at 23, 28, 40, whatever it is. To even me graduating, like Steve just being my friend, like I know I'm like a fucking nutcase because I'm like constantly changing. It's like, I don't even know how to interpret you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, and that's, and whenever those realizations happen, the amount of baggage that you had carrying to that is what I think compounds yeah. that effect, right? Yeah. Like maybe I have kids, I have a family, I have a house. Fuck, I don't want to do this anymore, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's everybody's different. You gotta you gotta play your hand. I mean, that's it. Look, we, we had, this has been an amazing podcast. We're going to start our closing remarks. <laughs> yeah, do it. And, you know, we've been talking for like two hours and 50 what minutes. What I love about yeah. this is that Kirk walked in, you've done other podcasts for other people, like you've actually yeah, produced yeah. them. How, how does this compare? It's, well, it's way different, eh? We jump around everywhere. It's way longer. Usually I advise them like 10, 15 minutes on like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same thing. You didn't like, know. It's like. And you're, you're getting into it now. No, I told, I can do this. This is where, like, if I meet with somebody, I this is eventually what I'll start. You guys can be a part of it, is with the bakery company to develop it into a community where I'm not selfishly gathering everybody that works with me, but for the sake of, like, bouncing business ideas off yeah. of each other, building other relationships that can help outside of whatever I can provide. It's beyond a portfolio. It's actually a community. Exactly. And yeah. so I just like having these conversations, typically business minded, self development minded, like those are like what grow, right? Yeah. Like somebody's gotta be that other person, like Kirk, thirty five dollars, that's fucking cheap, you should probably do forty five. Like somebody has to say that. I said forty. Forty, okay. 40. I said creep it up. <laughs> creep up. Ten dollars <laughs> is a hike. I mean nobody's gonna nobody's gonna be able Don't to get believe creepy that. now. So um, Don't be that guy. Yeah, I mean these this yeah, this podcast has been great. Um, thanks for having me guys. Like, yeah, absolutely really good. So yeah, I mean jumping around like this, we dived into a little bit of everything all night back and forth and it's been good. I've loved it and I, I think you know, like going forward for our listeners, I think it's it's important to understand like when we're talking about brand image, 
we've we've talked on numerous occasions on how to just always keep growing. Last week's podcast was purely on always growing and always grinding. Yeah. And and I think the important part is, is that you're always understanding where you're at in your life. You're always understanding where you're at to your means. And and we've we've also hinted on the fact tonight where you know we've we've talked about the fact that we need to when you're building a brand it needs to be real it needs to be pure it needs to be it needs to be what do you think that, what do you think that is your value to the world because that's honestly what your business is going to be yeah that's, that's what we think about this podcast that's why we have somebody on like tonight like with Kurt that's like last week with Miguel and the numerous others before Oh, yeah. You know, it's how do we add value to you and how do we get you to listen? That's what we think about when we talk about guests. And then if it's just you and I, Steve, you know, it's it's like what what can we bring to the best game that we can... And I, I don't think that... I'll throw this out there. I don't think listening to a podcast should be pur- purely on advice for me. I think it should be, if I'm talking about purpose... I think people should love learn. That. I think I love that. What purpose? Well, that's what you say. <laughs> no, you did. I, I I think I think when you're talking about that, and you're, when our listeners are listening to this, it's important to understand. I don't look at myself as someone to give advice to someone's life. I look at myself that these are the things I've done in my life. I love whiskey. I love cigars. And I can tell you a million different things about them. That's what brings us all together as a big picture. What we can talk about is how, what's the shit that's going on in your life? What's the shit that's going on in my life? We can all help each other. That's the difference. And the way that I can portray that is, hopefully, when I'm talking through this podcast, I don't give you advice on how to live your life. You learn from either what I've done, or you say, oh, well, that was cool. That gives me an idea on what I can do differently. It just provides context. That's the difference. That is the absolute difference. And we've had a bunch of different questions on tonight. We appreciate everyone that's been listening and contributing to the podcast. We did have a question a long time ago about um, rebranding and stuff like that. And we've been meaning, I've been meaning to get to it where Bobby asked, Bobby Crow asked, yep. how is it that you can rebrand yourself, but also, what was it, Dustin? Do you remember? It was... Uh, <clears throat> it's a while back. Yeah, it's something, something like Thanks. how how can you go about basically rebranding yourself? What, what does it mean and or take to rebrand someone? Cool. Well, you're talking about someone. I mean, that's like it's like deep stuff. I mean, it's rebranding is. I don't know. I mean, if it's talking about personally, like rebranding yourself, and maybe you are your company. Like as of right now, I am the maker. So whoever I am is my company. Um, I mean, that's just advice. I mean, the better it is learn your why, figure yep. out that. I mean, it's that, that's where I talked about before. If you're at that point where you're asking that question, that just means you need to spend more time on you, figuring out what's your why, what's your motivation, what's your situation. Yeah. Are you, is the hand in front of the face? Do you need to take, you know, a step back? Hey! hey. hey. I swear to God, you hey. use that in a client meeting. Yes! I always, I always so say... So where you are right now yeah. is that your, your I issues... See, you see here. You can't no, see me. Your issues are, are right here, and this is all you're focusing on. I love it. What happens is when you're focusing on the issues right here, what can you see? You see this is very blurry, and beyond it, you, you're trying to focus there. And you bring that out, now all of a sudden everything's in picture. Yeah. Yeah, you can use that. <laughs> well, I appreciate 40 that. bucks an hour. Though. 40 dollars an hour. <laughs> That's a quote that you oh bump your rate up. If, you if use, I use the hand, I use, use the hand. We get equity, though. We okay. get equity. No, no, no. At no. right, first, like, first one's, yeah. first one's free. First one's free. All right, first one's free. But it's an honor code. But yeah, I, I, I don't know what you guys would say to that. It, like he just said, um, you know, I try not to give advice, just give context. I mean, one of the smartest things that somebody ever told me was advice without context is the worst advice. Yeah. So the less that you know then, Bingo. the more that like you're, for example, if you're, you know, referring a type of whiskey, did you ask them what kind of whiskey they like? Do you ask what they like? What, Absolutely. What their, what their palate's like? What, 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 what do you they enjoy? Like? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're just like, oh yeah, this is the best. Like, you know, doesn't mean shit. Right. 
So you're just trying to sell something. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Steve? Well, if I could chime in. Oh, you're always allowed to. All right. So he's for, smiling for, over there. No. Nah, nah. So before I give my my quick uh, recap here and, and close remarks, I I do get it out of the way here. Uh, I do want to thank, uh, as you see in the, the picture, if you're watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube, uh, we have uh, Altus USA as our sponsor. What was our second cigar? So that's what I was say, yeah. I'm smoking the, the Romeo by Romeo. Romeo. Yeah, there it is. Romeo by Romeo <laughs> e Julieta. So uh, Paul Waller, who's the uh, sales manager for that, and, and, and you actually mentioned something about um, you know us reaching out to sponsors. Sometimes it will happen where you have those relationships where, like, so Paul was the rep for, for Altidus when I first started with Tinderbox at Easton. He got promoted and, and now he's a sales manager. And then um, when he started listening, he was local for a while, now he's moved a, a bit away, but he was the one that actually approached me, where he said, hey man, you guys are doing something, I wanna support you where I can. That's awesome. It's not a huge sponsorship, but oh, it's yeah. like, you know, so, like, so now they, they give us the second cigar, in, in a matter of speaking, they give the second cigar of the night, and they give us some money that it is in kind of a, a holding account, if you will, that if we need new mics, we need some of that production value that you're talking about, that you actually give advice to some of your, your clients. So, so that's something that if you do something well, you do it well enough, and you, you stay consistent, you stay true to yourself, that's where some things are going to happen. You still have to work for it. So Tinderbox at Easton is also another uh, sponsor of ours, uh, where, where Jake works, where I work full time. And that's where the Camacho Ecuador came from, which I actually really enjoyed with what we were drinking tonight. Yes. Um, and, and then you also have the BS Cigar Company, which is something that Jake's lighting up right now for the uh, third cigar of the night for him. I got the silver, though. It's, it's not silver. the gold, man. I normally get BS the gold. silver, which is made by Espinosa, um, did a killer job. So uh, we appreciate all our sponsors. What, what do you think I, about that question? Which one? With uh, Bobby. Like, how, how do you rebrand yourself and, like... So I so, yeah, so so with that when I look at that and, and I don't know how you think about this uh, Kirk but um, when when you, there are a lot of parallels we talk about this a lot with balance so when you actually uh, when you you look at personal relationships you look at romantic relationships and you look at business I think there's a lot of parallels there so when someone asks like Bobby asks you know how do you rebrand yourself yeah how do you have to do that these are these are the issues if you can do that successfully. Uh, within your own life. So this is a constant learning experience. This is a constant uh, self-awareness. This is something where you are trying to learn uh, from outside factors. Mm -hmm. All of those three things are very, very pertinent. And, and maybe you, you know, you know, you actually have a, a really pushed this on some of your clients, Kurt, where if you're, if you're not trying to do any of those three, three things, if you're not self-aware, and that's what I was talking to you about, just, just in conversation, that's what this is all about. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dogging or, or downing the fact that you, you sell yourself short as far as like what you charge people, but the self-awareness of, of what you're offering versus what the competition's offering, you know, that's something that you do deal with on your personal life. If, if something's not working and you, you are sacrificing what your morals or your, what your original values were to try to like make another dollar, make another, you know, another dollar in your paycheck on a personal level, or you're trying to do things that you think that you're supposed to do, that's where you start losing yourself. And in a sense, it's very, very parallel to a business. When you start doing these things that are actually compromising your, your brand, your brand image, when you're just doing it for another couple of ticks on the, on the profit margin, that's where you are, you are really walking a fine line and you're walking a slippery slope on, on a short-term gain, short gain versus a long-term gain. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you can actually, when you look at like, so I, I, I love this example. Say you own a garage and you have seven bays, right? And you're running that business. And clients are coming in, you know what I mean? They're bringing their cars in. We brought up cars earlier, you know, as far as preventative maintenance. And, and you, you have these, these people coming in, and out of the, the seven bays, you have, you know, three or four of them that you know are just, just die-hard, locked-down mechanics that work for you, that are loyal to you, they are loyal to the customers, and then you have the other three that are just like a, a revolving door. So you always have this, this, this side of you, and this is, again, I'm going to work on the parallels, 
where there's a part of you that you're always solid. You will never, never give. These are the morals that you hold, you hold fast to. But then these other ones that you, you, you think you know what you should do, but at the same time, it's like you, you give a little bit, you know, because you're trying to like actually gain a little bit and you sacrifice a little bit. But what is the long-term goal and what is the actual, and that's the whole thing with the, the brand thing where I was saying earlier, it's like, what's the concept and what is, what is true to you? What are you trying to do? And what is going to put the, the, the end goal, what, the means to the end, what is going to get you here? That has to be very, very universal and very, very consistent as it goes from A to B. So when you have this garage all of a sudden, it's like, do you want those, those customers coming back for those three revolving doors that aren't happy with your business, that are doing the Google reviews, that are doing the Yelp reviews, that are doing all that stuff, and, and bottom line, they're costing you money, or do you say, you know what, I'm gonna actually have, I have seven days, and now I gotta revamp my business. I'm not looking just for sales growth over last year, this year, I'm actually looking at sales growth, or just growth, when you look at personal, side of it, personal relationships, whether it be romantic or just friendship or family. So I'm gonna do this, so I'm actually gonna just, you're all gone. Now I'm down to four days. And I know it's gonna be locked solid, I'm gonna take care of these people. Now I have to actually, to, to self-reflect and bring it back into myself internally and say, all right, so I need to add from four to five. Now I have the growth to be like five to six. And in those steps, it might take longer than you want it to be and your sales might not, grow like you want to, and that's where I look at you, Kirk, where it's like the $35 an hour type thing. It's like, it's, it's, it's creeping up, but do you, do, you, do you warrant that value? And that's where like the personal rebranding thing is, is sometimes you actually wake up and then you've woken up several times and you actually, you don't, you don't like what you see. You don't like your life. You don't like all of that stuff. And you don't make rash decisions, but it's, at some point you say, I can't have all these bays open because I actually, I don't have the capacity for that. I can't be successful at the capacity that I am, I am I'm currently holding. So now I have to tool back a little bit. I have to just bring it back a little bit. I'm not gonna completely just, done, I'm, I'm gonna leave everyone, I'm gonna move across the country, I'm gonna move to another country, I'm gonna move across the world and just like, fuck it, I'm, I'm gone. No, it's literally just like tapering it back to a point where you feel comfortably confident. And I think, and I think that's personal, and I think that's business. I think that's that's something that sometimes when you when you talk about brand image, whether it be personal brand or or professional brand, there is something that's very very relatable where you have to have that confidence, so that if you have a customer, if you have someone in your life, on a personal side of it, that they actually they feel that confidence, so that people buy from people they like. And people actually relate to people they like, and they take advice from people they like, and in turn, you start living your life the same way, and you start running your business the same way. Yeah. That that is your brand. That is your professional brand, that is your company brand, and that is also your, your personal brand. That that is how you wake up in the morning, and you're a great example, Kurt. You are not happy. You are doing your best, you're working your ass off. No one takes that away from you when you're doing the gym thing, but when it comes down to it, fast forward to years later, and now all of a sudden you have fulfillment because you feel confident. You know what you're doing. You know what the bigger scope is. And five years from that, your, your scope will be broader and at the same time more narrow because it is more focused yeah. on what is important. I think when you, I'll add one thing to that though. Like Please do. When you're, when you're talking about that though, when you're in, you're speaking on the, like the, if you go from seven bays down to your main four, yeah. the guys that you keep, right? I think you need to value their time and pay them more. I'll say that. Within your means. Yeah. I think you need to value their time because they're... You well, you know, they're work. You don't have that. You don't have that negative side. You don't have, the, you don't have to put the cash back out there. But it's much You know like, they're going to do it right. Yeah, but it's much like my, you know, when my dad was working for Fuller Oil and doing fuel oil business, it's like when he left... After thirty five, almost forty years, they sold the business. Yeah, because the brand stuck with him. Because his clients, when he hauled fuel oil and diesel fuel and everything, they wanted him as the driver because mm -hmm. he knew because they knew that he would get shit done right. You know what I mean? But from so a like, business standpoint, there's always that growing and all that stuff. And you true, have to, true. You have true. to know those inside threats 
and the outside threats, and that's where you have that training program. Like that's that brand. How is the brand consistency? We didn't talk about that much tonight. Is the consistency? How long do you want to own this business? Are you you're doing it to sell it <laughs> off? Or are you doing it to to retire on and pass on to your kids? That's a, a relative thing. I don't know if you ask that of your clients when you actually look at big big picture. Is what is again? What's the end goal? Are you trying to sell this off to a bigger business? I can I can brand you accordingly. I can I can market you accordingly. Are you trying to pass this off to your grandkids? We got a different goal. Right. We got a different strategy too. Right. One hundred percent. Yeah. This has been amazing. We appreciate you, Kurt, for coming out tonight. This Thanks has been me. this has been awesome. Your insight is unmatched, I think, for you know what we've done. And uh, you know, to Bobby Crow, he he's. He's always got a bunch of questions. Bobby, thanks but, for being on. Man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And uh, his birthday was actually last week. We, you know, we happy birthday. Yeah. yeah. Two things. I do want to give a shout out to uh, my dad. Yeah. Passed away. His birthday was today. I went out to the grave today. Next Wednesday, there's another important birthday. Uh, next week, you will see uh, our special guest, Dustin Bovey. Yeah. How old are you turning? Thirteen. 33, yeah. 33? So, so, so Dustin Bowie is going to be uh, 43 to, uh, next week. 31. On the 12th. 43, I heard. Uh, so we're going to have a special uh, guest uh, next week. So thank you for that. Yes. And See you next week. So Bobby asked, very last question in the evening. How you get, or how how do you get... How you got to your image. Yeah, yeah like, I, I, I think I think the biggest thing, like how we got to our image. And I'll just like speak for us. As That's where, what he was going towards. Yeah, it's like, I think it's about much like the tinder box. This is where the guy kind of brought in my scope. Is it? It starts with your passion and the community that you want to base your business off of, because that's what really drives people towards that. You know what I mean? And I think that that is unmistakably the, the most valuable aspect of it. Um, thank you, Kurt, for being on. Yeah, I mean, Kurt, thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, guys. It's been fun. Thank you, everyone, for yeah. tuning in. Please like, please share, give us a five star review. And where can they find you on Instagram, Twitter? Um, so either one, you can either message me personally. It's just Kurt Cottle at Kurt Cottle, and or at the Matry Company. I'm in those every single you day. You follow our page so I can tag you. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Listen, I downloaded like five of your episodes today to make sure that yeah. I was like... Yeah, that on Facebook will be able to tag you. All right, cool, cool. Yes. Do and that. don't forget, we're always on Spotify, we're on Facebook, we're on iTunes. We're also on an Overcast on uh, Android devices. YouTube. So, and YouTube. There's no reason why you should not listen to this. This has been a great episode. And we, honestly, my personal opinion, we've been really, really killing these episodes. This is episode 44 with Kurt Cutter. Giveaways tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're doing our uh, giveaway box from Crown Heads and Miguel uh, tomorrow. So you still have time if you're listening to our live viewers. What you time tomorrow? Uh, I'll give them till 5. All right. 5 p.m. live thing. So if you listen to us on uh, Friday or next week, you're, you're 5. 5 p.m. So <laughs> go to our post. Go to our post. It's a video with Miguel. Read what is required and do that and you will be entered to win. We're give, giving away a gift box of cigars. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors, Tinderbox at East and Altidus Cigars USA. Thank you, be a cigar company. That's what I'm smoking now. It's probably what Steve will light up later. Thank you, Kirk, for the Waffen Zone, man. I know, anytime. He's keeping we should feature that next week. Yes, we should. Yeah, that's next week's episode. All right, perfect. I'm Jake Sanders along with Steve Crane. We make up the Bourbon and BS podcast, episode 44. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Happy Whiskey Wednesday.